Our programs offer many languages. Please visit suprememastertv.com forward slash schedule. Nos programas offer plusieurs langues. Veuillez visiter suprememastertv.com bar oblique schedule. Nuestros programas ofrecen varios idiomas. Visiten suprememastertv.com barra inclinada schedule. Nuestros programas ofrecen varios idiomas. Acesse suprememastertv.com barra schedule. Hamare karyakram pesh kiye jate hain kai bhashao mein. Kripya dekhe suprememastertv.com forward slash schedule. The precepts are very important, not only for nuns and monks, but for you as well, if you want to be liberated while you are taking care of your duties in the world according to your karma. Please continue watching to find out more. Supreme Master Ching Hai's lectures are not a complete meditation instruction. Please do not try alone. For free of charge guidance, please visit godsdirectcontact.org or contact any of our centers near you. Today's episode will be presented in English with subtitles in Arabic, Aulasis, also known as Vietnamese, Bulgarian, Chinese, Czech, English, French, German, Hindi, Hungarian, Indonesian, Japanese, Korean, Malay, Mongolian, Persian, Polish, Portuguese, Punjabi, Romanian, Russian, Spanish, Chalogel, and Thai. Tahayat Mubhija. مشاهدين محبي السلام اسم ناش الشعب التونسي المحب يصلي أن يبقى الله دائبا بجانبكم تقع تونس على الساحل البحر المتوسط في شمال غرب أفريقيا في منتصف الطريق بين المحيط الأطلسي ودلتا النيل وتعتبر بوابة بين أفريقيا وأوروبا تحدد تونس تراث ثقافيا غنيا يعود تاريخه إلى 3000 سنة من الحضارات القديمة متضمن تنوعا من الثقافات الأوروبية والمتوسطية والإسلامية والبدوية المناخ اللطيف بالساحل الشرقي للبحر الأبيض المتوسط قد شكل شواطئ زرقاء يقوطية وأرض صالحة بامتياز لزراعة الزيتون تحتل تونس مرتبة ضمن العشرة الأوائل في إنتاج زيت الزيتون في العالم ومن الرائع إنها تستخدم طرق تقليدية قديمة لإنتاج الزيت وتتمتع بالصحراء صحارة رائعة جنوب البلاد هناك يفتن الزوار بالمشاهد المذهلة للكثبان الرملية التي تنحتها الرياح وغروب الشمس الصحراوي الذهبي والليالي المليئة بالنجوم الخاطفة للأنفاس ربما أعظم سحر في تونس آت من شعبها التونسيون أنقياء ويملأهم الشغف يحترمون التقاليد يستمتعون بالحياة ولا يعكر صفهم صخب وضجيج محيطهم هنا حيث يمكن للجميع العثور على سعادتهم الخاصة 
يسرنا أن نقدم لكم لمحة موجزة عن تونس ساحرة القلوب مشاهدينا الطيبون نحن نصلي لكي تتحقق رؤياكم وأحلامكم الرائعة على مدى أكثر من ثلاثة عقود كبيرة المعلمين تشينغ هاي تنير درب عالمنا من خلال تعاليمها الإلهية كمعلم حقيقي تمنح المعلمة طريقة الكوانيين في التأمل لأولئك التواقين لاكتشاف طبيعة الله داخلهم وتحقيق التحرر الأزلي من دوامة الحياة الموت خلال حياتهم طريقة الكوانيين مورست من قبل سائر المعلمين مستنيرين أمثال بوذا كونفوشيوس والغور رناك ويوسوع المسيح لاوتزو الإله كريشنا الإله مهافيرا والنبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والعديد غيرهم إنها تؤكد إنه بذكرنا الحثيث لله والتضحية من أجل الآخرين وعدم انتهاك القوانين الكونية سنصل لأعلى مرتبة يمكن أن يبلغها بشر وندرك الهدف من وجودنا على هذه الأرض كبيرة المعلمين تشينغ هاي هي مثال حي واستثنائي للرحمة فهي تقوم بانتظام بتقديم المساعدات العينية والمالية فضلا عن المحبة للاجئين والمشردين والمتررين من الكوارث الطبيعية وسواهم ممن يحتاجون الغوث كبيرة المعلمين تشينغ هاي ممتنة بشدة لله تعالى على كل المساعدة المالية والمواساة والدعم الذي يقدم للمحتاجين والأقل حظا أو لأي قضية نبيلة طوال هذه السنوات بوصفها أداة متواضعة تنقل رحمة الله ومحبته لأبنائه الغاليين كبيرة المعلمين تشينغ هاي تتلقى الدعم والمحبة من مختلف المنظمات ووسائل الإعلام والحكومات والأفراد فضلا عن العديد من الجوائز منها جائزة غوسي للسلام عام 2006 وهي تضاهي جائزة نوبل للسلام في الشرق جائزة القيادة الروحية العالمية في عام 1994 جائزة مهفير في عام 2008 وتم الإعلان عن يومي فبراير 22 و 25 أكتوبر يوم كبيرة المعلمين تشينغ هاي ومواطن فخري في الولايات المتحدة وقد كرمت على مر السنين بمنحها العديد من الجوائز وأوسمة الشرف تقديرا لأعمالها الخيرية والإنسانية المتميزة
نأسف لعدم قدرتنا على عرض المزيد من الجوائز والتكريم لعدم وجود المساحة ولضيق الوقت بقى صوت حقيقي يدافع عن أصدقائنا الحيوانات الجميلة كبيرة المعلمين تشينغهاي تشجع على إتباع النظام الغذائي النباتي المفعم بالمحبة والسلام الذي من شأنه إيقاظ الوعي الإنساني لمدى قدسية الحياة بكافة أشكالها وصولا إلى عالم مجيد تعمه النباتية ويسوده التناغم حيث الحيوانات والبشر يعيشون في وئام إن مبادراتها لنشر النهج النباتي متنوعة وتشمل توزيع نشرات العيش البديل وسلسلة المطاعم النباتية الدولية لافينك هات شركات المنتجات الغذائية النباتية شركات الفراء النباتية والتلفزيون كبيرة المعلمين بالإضافة إلى مكالمة الحكومات وكبريات وسائل الإعلام والمشاركة في مؤتمرات عبر الدائرة التلفزيونية مغلقة بشأن تغير المناخ علمنا بذلك أم لم نعلم إن لجهودها تأثير هائل على الوعي العالمي فيما يخص الإحسان للحيوانات وكيف أن نمط الحياة هذا يمكن أن يحقق السلام الدائم بين الدول إضافة لإنقاذ كوكبنا من أثار تغير المناخ والكوارث على مر السنين جابت كبيرة المعلمين تشينغ هاي العالم من الأمريكيتين إلى أفريقيا ومن أوروبا إلى أوكيانوسيا وألقت مئات المحاضرات أمام الجمهور وتلاميذها متناول باقة متنوع من المواضيع الروحية يشرفنا اليوم أن نقدم واحدة من هذه المحاضرات العميقة بعنوان سوران جاما سوترا التعليمات الأربعة الواضحة غير القابلة للتغيير عن النقاء الخاتمة وتأسيس مكان الصحوة الجزء واحد من ثمانية ضمن سلسلة بين المعلمة والتلاميذ المقدمة باللغة الإنجليزية في 24 ديسمبر 2018 Hello there. Uh, I should have a hat, right? I have one somewhere. I thought tomorrow is uh, Christmas Day, no? Why you wear a hat already tonight? I have no idea. I was going to wear, but I thought we save it for tomorrow. Tomorrow I wear it to make up, okay, huh? Make up for today. How are you? Yeah. <laughs> 大家好。今天已经圣诞节了吗? <笑> Is it already Christmas today? Yes. Huh? No, huh? After midnight, right? Yes. I have three and a half hours, then I can run back to it. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. You look good in hat. <laughs> My God, the Taiwanese, they really can. Did they tell you to bring or they just give it you here? Oh, wow, how can they buy oh, 10,000 hats in one day? <laughs> More than 10,000 perhaps. Oh, incredible, incredible, incredible. Wow, wow, <laughs> wow. All these are nuns? Yes. Wow. Omitofo, <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> you a monk, you can sit up here, love. Monk, missionary, you can come up, sit here. Yeah, are you a missionary? No, then you sit there. 
<laughs> Only for monks and nuns, just to respect their wish to be alone. You can sit on there, it's softer and warmer. You left everything at home. At least you can have a little comfortable here. If it's you, you would want to be comfortable. So just make them comfortable as you are. You should do everything just the way you, you would like it for yourself. It's so simple, my God. Huh? If you're uncomfy, you can also come up and sit a little bit higher. Uh, if you have a cushion, it's good. You should take care of yourself, okay? Because you are many, I'm only one. I can't take care of all of you, huh? For the elderly, you should take better care. You know why? The monks especially, because they sacrifice all their life. For what? You know? For you, or for... At least for themselves to be liberated. At least they take care of themselves. The elder monks and nuns, they have spent all their lives in... in ascetism already, okay? The one who really want to practice, want to follow the Buddha, or want to follow Krishna, or want to follow Mahavira, whomever these masters are, they really want to follow this ideal. So in all their life they already uh, endure a lot to reach God whether they have rich or not, but they have done their best, you know, everything they've done according to the ideal, okay? So we, especially the elder monks and nuns, you know, they have been enduring all their lives already, so it's better we take care of them. When we were younger, we were invincible, yeah? And when we're older, it's more difficult to adjust to different conditions. I keep telling you all the time. Yesterday I want to tell you something, and I tell you now before I forgot. I just say something, remember, like in the white magic? Because you were talking about trees. Remember that somebody touched some trees here and then he, he felt the vibration, you know, whatever that is, the blessing or the, the response, the love, whatever he felt. The, the tree, and he called that maybe Buddha tree. Yeah, all the trees are Buddha's tree, or magic trees. If you have respect for them, they respond, and they help you also, yes. I remember some other people will come and talk to the trees and all that, and have a wishing uh, come true, their wish come true and stuff like that, because remember last time I told you the, the story about the kusa grass, uh, gods, yeah, there was Sikamuni Buddha, uh, one of his uh, reincarnation. You were not there. Oh, you forgot already. <laughs> All right, so simple. Every grass, you know, like big, uh, maybe a group of grass, every tree has spirit of some kind that dwell in it. Yeah, take care of the tree, or that is their dwelling place. They are assigned to stay there, and that's their home, yes. And they do bless the surrounding as their job. Just like uh, police or something, he's assigned to some special station and give him a motorcycle, something like that to work with. Now, trees, they do have their magical power, their healing power, loving power, and they do help you with advices and all that even, but you, the deaf, don't hear nothing, see nothing. Yeah. So one of your brothers touched one or a tree and then he felt something from the tree. Now you know what I'm saying is true, yeah? You heard it yesterday, right? Now you know, at least you, the one who experiences, know that what I told you is the truth. I tell you the truth all the time, but at least that, in that aspect, you know one truth, okay? We sometimes don't believe the Master until, until we experience it ourselves. Never mind, I'm very patient, okay? Very, very, very patient. I wait for you eternally <laughs> until you know it yourself. Now, the trees and the uh, uh, grass and the plants, they all have their blessing power. I even told you that in Cancun. 
All right, so now, in a way it's magic kind of uh, practice, and people even advise you, you know, like you make friend with one tree that you like, and then if you are sick or you have problem, you just come and hug the tree or tell the tree your problem, and, and then promise you come back again to visit, and then you will get better. Yeah. Please don't hug all my trees because <laughs> too many of you, the trees already <laughs> feeling scared. <laughs> because everybody hug, then the tree will become like their skin will get uh, uh, worn out. Let them be, okay, huh? No touchy filly, huh? <laughs> you are saying already you should bless the trees, not vice versa. Shameless. Ah. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Uh, this is a, some kind of white magic that people practice like that, okay? Yeah. Uh, there, of course, there are many other ways to practice. It's just because yesterday you talked about the tree, so I want to mention that to you as well. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, now, where were we yesterday? Yesterday? Yes, yeah, okay. The precepts are very important, not only for nuns and monks, but for you as well, if you want to be liberated while you are taking care of your duties in the world according to your karma, yeah? Not everyone can be nuns and monks, of course. It's a very difficult uh, undertaking. Hmm? It's very difficult. It needs a lot of discipline, a lot of training yourself, a lot of self-introspecting, a lot of sacrifice, yeah, for personal taste, personal freedom, uh, everything, many things, many things. Yesterday, when I giving you some cookies or crackers, I say if you're hungry at night, maybe you shouldn't eat a lot, but you can eat a little bit of this to, to calm your stomach. I was talking to the nuns and the monks, and then one of you said, I'm hungry, master, hungry, master. <laughs> you always hungry when you see my cakes or my <laughs> so-called blessed food. I was talking to the monks and nuns in case, because the monks and nuns sometimes they don't eat in the evening. So I thought, okay, in case it's cold here and your time change and if you're really hungry, eat some a little bit of this exception. I was talking to these people, not you. Because you can always go kitchen anytime, after midnight, before midnight, uh, and then and take something to eat. The monks and nuns, they, mostly they don't do that. Maybe because they don't eat in the evening, maybe because they keep the dignity. I was worried the monks and nuns because of time change from their country here, you know, and maybe here midnight is, is there, midday over there, or before midday, so they, if they're hungry, they could eat a little bit to calm themselves, and then they meditate to erase that, whatever it's supposed to have, if karma. So yesterday, the Buddha have pleaded with the Bodhisattva and Ananda and all these people, saying that you should use your power of transformation and appear to the world in the form of uh, people, in the form, form of lay person, minister, kings, uh, virgin youth, maidens, and so forth, even prostitutes, widows, profligates, thieves, butchers, or dealers in contraband, and doing the same job like they are doing, in order to uh, lead them to uh, to the righteous place, and the teaching of the saints. But these people, you know, like the Bodhisattva or the monks, even though they appear thus, to work the same as other people, lowlier people or unenlightened people, but they should never say of themselves, like, I am truly a Bodhisattva, or I am truly an Ahat, or let the Buddha secret cause leak out by speaking casually to those who have not yet studied. What does that mean? Meaning, suppose you already initiated, yeah, you have all the instruction given to you how to meditate, yeah, and recite the five names and what to do, etc., etc. 
You should never tell that to other people who are not yet acquainted with the teaching and who not even know what the five names of meditation. Of course, as I told you at the time of initiation, you keep all that to yourself. Same here, same here. Otherwise, if it's not, then why the Buddha say that? Because it is true that the initiation should not be told to the people who are not acquainted to the teaching or who are not aspired, aspiring to become uh, one of the meditators or the true seeker and uh, those. Just like Jesus say, do not give pearl to the swine. The pearl, the precious pearl is likened to the teaching of God, yeah, of the initiation, precious teaching. We should not just go out and just say anything about that when they're not ready. Then the Buddha continued, how can people who made such claims other than at the end of their lives and then only to those who inherit the teaching be doing anything but deluding and confusing living beings and indulging in a gross false claim? So Buddha warned us that we should never do that. Maybe at the end of their lives and then only to those who are already in the path, you know, who inherited the teaching. That's what the Buddha meant. Those who already know the path, already know the initiation process. And then maybe at the end of your life, if you are really a Bodhisattva or a saint manifested, then you say, I am so and so. Now, uh, there was one uh, a guru in India, the Sikh Guru. I don't remember the third or the fifth, you know, one of, of the ten, one of the ten guru, Sikh Gurus. He was very old already, seventy-something. <laughs> but he has been, uh, he know nothing about um, practice or meditation. Until one day, he met uh, one of his acquaintance or family members who was uh, reciting something. Uh, some of the teaching. And then uh, he overheard it and he asked her, what is that uh, that you are reciting? So the, um, the, his uh, you know, acquaintance tell him, oh, this is a teaching of guru so-and-so, one of the Sikh guru before. And then he said, what is a guru? <laughs> she said, you don't know guru? You have no guru? Then don't come near me. <laughs> In India, uh, I don't know now, but before, if you have no guru at all, you don't have master teach you anything, then you are just a nobody. They don't let you in the kitchen <laughs> because they might be contaminated, <laughs> contaminated their, their food. Even the shadow, your shadow, if you have no guru, no master who teach you, I mean, real master teach you anything, they don't let even your shadow fall into their food or in their house or their kitchen like that. They worry <laughs> that your impurity, your karma, which have not been cleansed by the master power, by the initiation uh, process, uh, even your shadow will contaminate their energy of the houses or of the kitchen. The people who are not initiated never allow in the kitchen in any case. That bad. In Vietnam, we also say, if somebody has no religion, yeah, no religious belief, they say, oh, you are the non, the atheist, you know, the non-believer. <laughs> that means very bad. <laughs> I mean, kind of a degrading, you know, uh, a remark. Yeah, no respecting remark, yes. Because only the people who believe in karma, believe in bad and good, that it is trustworthy according to the Vietnamese okay, tradition. Because if somebody believes nothing, you know, don't worry about the bad consequences of his karma, of his uh, actions. That means he could do anything because he has no, no uh, principle to, up, to hold his action to be in a straight way or moral standard. Then he could harm you without even caring about the consequences. That's why people say, if you're no religious or no believer, mean you're bad, <laughs> untrustworthy, 
very scary people. That's what they meant. You understand? Yes. Because if you fear God, you fear karma consequences, then of course you will always try to do good things. Because you worry about the consequences of bad karma. But if you don't know nothing, you don't believe nothing, no master teach you, no religious principle, then you do anything. You see, and then you don't worry. So how can you trust such a person? It's just like somebody in the society who don't care about the law, who not worry about the police, or who don't care whatever happened, whatever he does. So he can just go to steal or maybe harming people without caring. It's not trustworthy. That's what it is. So the Buddha say that whoever claim himself to be a bodhisattva, except at the end of their life, when they have to review themselves, if they really know they are bodhisattva, and they review themselves to those who are already in the path, then it's okay. If not, then they are just deluding themselves and others. And that's a very bad uh, false claim, which is one of the greatest lies. Thus, when you teach people in the world to cultivate samadhi, they must also cease all lying. This is the fourth clear and unalterable instruction on purity given by the thirst come ones and the Buddhas and the world honored ones, you know, forever, in the past and now. Therefore, Ananda. One who does not cut off lying is like a person who carves a piece of human excrement. Yesterday we told already, and hoping that it will smell like sandalwood. And already yesterday the Buddha said, if you lie, especially you lie about your spiritual attainment, then it's like a poor person who claimed to be the emperor, and then his head will be chopped off. Very dangerous. So you like cutting off your enlightenment possibility now and in the future, if you tell lie. This is a problem. Some people, they just habit to tell lie. They don't even realize they're telling lie. Or they just make some excuses, yeah, and then to tell it as if it's true. And they think their excuse is valid anyway. Even though they know it's just an excuse, it's, it's not valid at all, they still say an excuse. And that is also lying. When you know it's not true, you just make up an excuse to cover up your, your action, then it's no good. So watch all the time your mind, because your mind is tricking you all the time. Due to habit, due to the company you keep, due to the job that you're doing, due to your surrounding, due to your family, tradition or kind of a lineage or just habit. So watch it all the time, okay? This is the most difficult to watch, because we always make excuse when we want to do something, we say, oh, I do that because of that, because of this. Whether or not it's true, and you don't care. And that is also lying, you should not. Always watch our mind. The Buddha say that if monks' minds are as straight as the lute strings, true and real in everything they do, then they can enter samadhi and never be involved in the deeds of demons. I certify that such people will accomplish the Bodhisattva's unsurpassed knowledge and enlightenment. Yeah, the Buddha guarantee. Eh? I told you yesterday, just a repeating. Oh, I just forgot the, the guru. He was very old. One of the Sikh guru was... Uh, Amar Das. Amar Das. Okay, thank you, my love. Thank you. I forgot. It's a long time since I studied all this. <laughs> it's 30-something years already. Passed so fast. 40 years even, almost 40 years. Whew, time passed, eh? My God. Okay, so he was very old. Yeah, and then he heard that, oh, without a guru, you are nothing. <laughs> you are uh, kind of rejected by even your own friend or, or your own family members. Oh, and he said, okay, where do I find a guru? <laughs> Just like, where is a supermarket or something? <laughs>
somebody who knew him long time, and then uh, show him where to go and find the Sikh guru to study with him. And then he became that guru's servant, very humble servant. Every day he served him with all his mind, all his heart, all his love. And then somehow, even though he was old already, but he was so pure, so sincere, so thirsty for God that the guru <laughs> even passed on the mantle of guruship to him. And of course, the son of that guru, you know, the original guru was so jealous of him. He find all kind of thing, all kind of picky thing to just to degrade him all the time. One time he passed by when the guru was talking or teaching, and then he said, why? Huh? You think you're somebody, you even grow a long beard like my father. You think that looks like my father, and then you are a guru or something, huh? Like he was very, you know, very jealous and degrading him in front of people, humiliating. Why do you grow such a long beard? Yeah, for what? And the guru said, It's just to clean your shoes, my lord. You remember that? My long beard just to clean your shoes. Because he was saying, you are just a servant, and now you grow a bear like my father, and then you think you're a guru of some sort, and you grow a long bear. And say, I use it just to clean your shoes. Yes. That's uh, what masters are. They are not really boastful. They don't mind whatever say to them. If they are disciples, then of course the guru will try to correct him or her and say, oh, you should not say such thing. It's a bad karma for you or something. But this person is too arrogant and so too ignorant, and he, he was already out of tune with the fathers, which was a guru teaching, so he could not argue with him much. So he has to say, I grow it bare long so I can clean your shoes with it. One time I was in India, and one of the masters, I don't know what did I do, I don't remember, <laughs> and he hit me on the head with his hand like this. I said, you're too hard. <laughs> so I said to him, please use your shoes, master. I don't hurt your hand. <laughs> I really meant it. I was nobody anyway. And it's just a natural thing to react that way, because normally master, Mm, if uh, they touch you or hit you, maybe he, they become contaminated by your karma. <laughs> so I'm worried, so I told him, use your shoes <laughs> to hit me instead of the hand. But he didn't hit again. Yeah. Okay, so now the Buddha here also tells us that even if you are a bodhisattva and you use your transformation power, to do some worldly job in order to teach other beings, still you don't review yourself. Then the Buddha continue saying that if one does not practice any of these tokens of renunciations of the body on the causal level, then even if one realizes the unconditioned, one will still have to come back as a person to repay one's past debts, exactly as I had to undergo the retribution of having to eat the grain meant for horses. But I told you yesterday already, it's just the karma of the world and the disciple that made it happen that way, because the Buddha would never be in any defilement in order to have to undergo any retribution at all. The Buddha has been Buddha for countless of aeons, and he is never defied in any way. He has never any karma. It is all appearance in this delusional world like that. Because the real Buddha has become just like an ordinary being. He has to go and beg for food, he has to wear the robe, he has to do things, and it's just like any human beings. So it's just so ordinary that people cannot always believe that he's a Buddha or a saint. Even people try to kill him or assassinate him or harm him in many different ways, or even defiling him, yeah? accusing him wrong thing. Like one of the women came and accused that the Buddha make her pregnant. And then the Hufa 
<laughs> beat her stomach up, and then the pillow comes out. <laughs> but the Buddha would never say anything. It's just the, the Dharma God did that, and then the pillow comes out. <laughs> Instead of any baby inside, just pillows. Mm. Yeah, the Buddha has never harmed anyone, you know, even in that lifetime. He just went out, beg for food, come back, meditate, and teach his own disciples, mind his own business. And still somebody wants to, how do you say, humiliate him like that. Imagine, huh? He done nothing wrong. Mm? Yeah, but he says something like, you don't wear leather, you don't wear silk, you don't drink milk, you don't eat butter. Oh, of course, it probably harms some business. Yeah, and some of these uh, business people probably get angry with him and want to show him up, yeah, like that. So it is very difficult to be in a position of spiritual teacher. There's always some trouble waiting for you <laughs> somewhere. There's always somebody who don't like you, uh, even your own disciples. So yesterday we read all that already, so I skipped it. Oh yeah, about the prostitute and everything, and butchers and everything already. Mm. Okay, Ananda, you ask about collecting one's thoughts. I have now begun to explain the wonderful method of cultivation for entrance into samadhi. Those who seek the Bodhisattva way must first be as pure as glistening frost in keeping these four rules of deportment. If one is able to never give rise to anything superfluous, then the three evils of the mind and the four of the mouth will have no cause to come forth. So just keep your mind, keep control of your mind. Every time something bad arises, just cut it off. Think of something opposite, something more noble, something clean, moral. Because the, um, the mind is, is something, it's like, it's like a habit uh, computer, and it just keeps coming out whatever it has received, you know, by the habit or by the surrounding, by the society, by the company you keep. So just keep, keep him in, in straight line, yeah? Walk the line. <laughs> Before I forgot, we should really thank uh, the past masters, monks and nuns and scholars who have taken time to record what the Buddha is teaching after the masters and nirvana, and also for the past and present person, lay or monks or nuns who have really dedicated themselves, sacrificed their time and precious health or under any difficult situation to translate this so that I can read it to you. And we have to thank them. And may they be blessed forever by all the Buddhas, past, present and future. May their merit be immense. May they be liberated forever. Thank you. <laughs> yes. We should put this section in, in the front and in every time, in the beginning of every segment of the lecture, if we show it on TV. You should put it in the end also, beginning and the end of any segment of this lecture, of this uh, continuous series of lecture. Okay, now, Ananda, if one does not neglect these four matters and further, if one does not pursue forms, fragrances, taste, or objects of touch, then how can any demonic deeds arise? I mean, we keep our mind pure, simple. Have what we use, use what we have. Have what we need. Need and greed are different. Therefore, we have to keep our mind in 
straight line, yeah? Knowing how much the mind will can lead us astray, we have to keep it under control, using the Buddha's teachings. The Buddha say, if there are people who cannot put an end to their habits from the past, you should teach them to single-mindedly recite my light atop the Buddha's summit, unsurpassed spiritual mantra. The Buddha taught many mantras, okay? Uh, for you, just recite the five names and uh, the seven gifts, okay? That would be good enough for you busy, <laughs> busy body lifestyle. In our modern time, we have many uh, comfort due to splendid inventions of all kinds. Our lives have become more comfortable and convenient. Nevertheless, because of that, we also have to work harder in order to earn them. In the Buddha's time, it's easier to practice purity of mind, I think, yes? Because you don't go too, too far anywhere. You just eat whatever inside your community that produced, yeah? And you just uh, interact with each other in, in your village, in your hometown mostly. Most people are like that. And things they eat are very simple. And they don't have to buy a car to go out to a big supermarket to buy a, a color television. Before, we don't even have television. And then we have a black and white television. And then later we say, what? You still have black and white? No, I want a color television. And I don't just want a, <laughs> a normal TV. I want super-sized TV, flat screen, etc., etc. Therefore, we work harder, we're busier, and our mind is so difficult to control to the limit of what we need. Instead of just be satisfied <laughs> with what we have, we want more and more all the time. Therefore, we are always in need. And when we are in need, we must think of the way to have what we think we need. And then we forget what is important in life. We have to keep up with the Jones, and then we forgot that we should keep up with the saints. We should remember what's important, because this life we will leave behind. Everything we have we must leave behind, anytime, anyway. You don't even know if it's tomorrow or next day. But just too busy, busy, forget, forget. Thus, we, the practitioners of the Kuan Yin method, always have to remind ourselves what is important, what is less important. And whatever we can minimize, downsize your life, then just do that. So that you don't have to spend your precious moment thinking of how to get more things. Uh, a precious moment, thinking of, I have to go out and buy this, buy that. To buy, you need car, you need other people, you need petrol, you need time, you need to earn money. And that will cost us a lot of time, a lot, a lot of time, a lot of precious time. And if we have also been married with children and kids, then oh, good luck, <laughs> good luck to you. <laughs> because there will be no end to your obligation and duties. You have to work harder, harder. Being a monks and nuns is a tough job, but I don't know if it's tougher to be uh, lay people with families and children and the in-laws and the bossai in-law and the death anniversary, birth anniversary, marriage anniversary. Who if you forget? Uh, I think my life is tough because I work so hard. But it, it's different. I work for the world. I work for others. I don't work for myself. Of course, I do work for myself also, but that is not the point. Most important is work for the world, for others. So whenever I go somewhere, I do something. I always ask, is this good for the world? Is this better for the world this way? Where do I stay so that I can meditate better? Where do I stay so that I can get a better spiritual merit point to give it to the world? Always this question. I never ask like, 
where do I stay so that I get more food, <laughs> or more, more comfortable, I become more pretty, and get more things, you know, nothing. I came here new, like all of you. I have no true uh, a house yet. I just stay in one of the ready-made house, you know. You know, we have many buildings already here before, and all the Buddhas and Bodhisattva, they resided here before we came. So I just let it be like that, okay? So all of you, the Christian, the Hindu, the Sikhs, the Jain, or <laughs> the Seventh-day Adventist, the Hare Krishna, do not think that Master is by us with Buddhism. It's not like that. It, this place has been for Buddhists because the people are, are Buddhists, okay? They were vegetarian and all that. So they put a lot of Buddha statues, Bodhisattva, Bodhidharma and all that around. And they also have other kind of lesser Bodhisattva, some divas or local gods and stuff like that, but they moved them all already. Their own <laughs> gods they moved. It's just the Bodhisattva and Buddha are already stationary. They stand fixed, <laughs> they don't move. So we just leave them as is, okay? If I can, I have time, I will invite others, uh, saints, to come to our place. Yeah, because now it's, uh, this place is officially ours, we can have more gods. <laughs> So each of your gurus, your master, your original God, will have a chance to come <laughs> and stay with us. Okay? Yes. Uh, so do not think, uh, I am just for Buddhists. I told you I don't belong to any religion. I told you long, long, many, many years ago when I first came out, when I was still a little bit somebody, but not much of anybody. I still am not much, but a little bigger than before. Before that, I already told you in one of the lectures, I don't belong to Buddhism or Catholicism or anything, okay? I belong to the truth. I preach the truth, that's what I say, okay? It's still the same, yeah. yeah. Nevertheless, of course, I respected all the masters and all religions because they did the same. They preached the same. That doesn't mean that I am just a no religious person. It's not like that. I just don't want to make another ism. That's why they always, the disciple and even government advised me to make a religion. And then I will have more uh, advantage, more freedom, easier. But say, I don't want to make another one. We have so many religions already. Why, why make another religion? <laughs> you know, have more competition, more complication. And then later, when I die, I make so many churches, many temples again, a Qinghai church here, a Qinghai temple there. And then to take up space, and people have to clean the church and temple every day. The Buddha continue. It is the invisible appearance atop the summit of the thirst come one. It is the spiritual mantra proclaimed by the Buddha of the unconditioned mind who comes forth from the summit in a blaze of light and sits upon a jewel lotus flower. And now he's talking about Ananda's private life, a private um, connection with Manjusri, or with that prostitute who almost corrupted him, and etc., uh, etc. Et so uh, I cut that off. Oh, you want to listen as well? Yes. I just talk about the precept here, okay? All right. Oh, never mind. I just read it to you. What is more, your past lives with uh, Mataji's daughter created accumulated kalpas of causes and conditions. Your habits of fondness and emotional love go back not just one life, nor even just one kalpa. Yet, as soon as I proclaimed it, she was free forever from the uh, affection in her heart and accomplished a hardship. There was a prostitute who, who was very, very uh, infatuated with Ananda because he looked very handsome, supposed to. And she always tried to seduce him. And one time, Ananda has to go through her area, 
her house in order to go for arms, and he has to go to her house to beg for arms, because the Buddha don't let any monk go to the same place all the time, in order to avoid attachment, yeah, and discrimination between the rich and the poor, yeah, because the Ananda sometimes, uh, sometime before that, he always went to the the poor people to beg for alms because he think like this he can give merit to the poor because the poor people need more merit than the rich. <laughs> Therefore Buddha said, no, you don't do that. You just go every house with the same love, with the same yeah. blessing. Yeah, you cannot discriminate and just bless just one type of people. Therefore, well, that day was Ananda's turn to go to different areas, including the prostitute's house. And this prostitute, she has been waiting for a long time <laughs> for Ananda. And now the Buddha explained why. They had affinity with each other, seen kaupas, aeons already. And he's always have returned and returned like this. This life is the same. But after the Buddha has explained all this, she became ahat. She also became a nun and compete with Anand, who is more enlightened who was faster <laughs> to get enlightenment. <laughs> that was like that. Uh, it doesn't say here, which is, I, I know that from other sutra, okay? Yeah. There's something maybe that some of you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you clapping? Because of the calendar talk? Because of my teaching. Oh, I just copied from the Buddha. <laughs> yeah, because of your teachings, Master, all your information benefits us spiritually and physically in the world. Thank you so oh, thank much. You, thank you. I just have to explain a little bit more so that you know the, the background of this situation, why the Buddha. Originally, I want to skip it, remember? Uh, this is his private thing and all that, but I thought, never mind, I just read it. I thought I would read it, quick, 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 but then I remember this story, and then I begin talking. Ha, habit dies hard. Yeah, <laughs> I just have to tell you what is what. Okay then, now, so she has accomplished a hardship, hmm? this so-called prostitute. Hmm. That prostitute, the Buddha continued, that prostitute who had no intention of cultivating, before she met Anand, she always wanted to wait for Ananda to trap him. Mm. Uh, she was imperceptibly aided by that spiritual power and was swiftly certified to the position beyond learning. Oh, she's gone so fast into the spiritual elevation, yeah. beyond learning. I mean, she already too enlightened. These people no need to learn anymore, yes. Then what about you, sound hearers in the assembly, who seek the most uh, supreme vehicle and are resolved to accomplish Buddhahood? He asked, question mark. For you, it should be as easy as tossing dust into a favorable wind. What then is the problem? The Buddha man look at the prostitute. She had no intention to practice any spiritual thing, any teaching, nothing. She was a prostitute even. It's the kind of opposite of spiritual way of life. For example, like that. The people look down upon prostitutes, they think they are nothing, they have no moral, no understanding, no concept of a decent life. In any country, people look down upon prostitutes. Even in, in such a free country, where prostitution is like a, a professional job and is illegally practiced, still people do not think well of prostitutes. Therefore, Buddha said to the assembly of, of monks and maybe others, diva and dragon and, and lay people, he said, see, has no idea of spiritual practice, no intention. And after I explained to her, with my power, she became a heart. I mean, not immediately like that, but she intended to become a nun right away. And she ran to Buddha, because Ananda, he almost succumbed to her charm. And then he prayed to the Buddha, please help me, Master, help me, because she was already pinning him down like 
on the bed or something, and she was beginning her job, and <laughs> he was already almost gone. But then he remembered the Buddha, said, please help me, please help me. And then the Buddha used his transformation body or sent somebody. And then Ananda immediately can escape, or awaken, like as if from a dream, and then he ran back to the Buddha. And this uh, Manjaji's daughter, <laughs> the prostitute, run behind. So she was running <laughs> after Ananda, <laughs> and both of them arrived in front of the thirst come one. And then she said, give me back my man. I want him, I want him, I love him. <laughs> Return him to me. <laughs> she uh, complained to the Buddha. He already mine. Uh, why you take him back? Uh, give it back to me, okay? And then Buddha said, okay, calm down. W what is it about Ananda that you like him so much? She think about it and say, oh, uh, I, I like his eyes, yeah. She couldn't say anything, it's too much in love, too much, you know, very, uh, already too intoxicated in her physical desire and love for Ananda. This is because of karma in the past lives, you see that, okay? She cannot help herself, she cannot. Of all the men that she, she knew in the past and that up to that moment, she cared about nobody. Prostitutes, they do business, they don't fall in love, nothing. But only Ananda she likes, and whom she's in love with, a monk. <laughs> That's the problem. So the, she, she said to, to the Buddha, I love Ananda's eyes. He said, oh no, these eyes, oh, it's uh, full of, you know, uh, ugly things that come out, the white stuff sometimes come out, the tears running down, and, and if he's sick, all these pools coming out, you don't want this, uh, his eyes. So she said, I, I like his, his nose. She said, <laughs> then she said, I love his nose. <laughs> because the Buddha asked, what's the reason you like him? What is it about him? I said, I love his nose now. He said, no, 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 you don't want, oh, there's all kind of things that coming now, you know, when he blow the nose, oh, all this sticky stuff, oh, oh, ugly, ugly, oh, you don't want like that. And then she said, <laughs> I like his mouth. <laughs> then the Buddha also continued to tell her that, oh, no, 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 you don't want that. It's all this, uh, you know, phlegm coming out sometime, and then the saliva is full of germs in the earth. No, 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 this is a thing that you should not like. And continue further, further, until she has no more reason <laughs> to like him. Yeah, the ears and whatever. She said the Buddha just flattened it out for her. Then after a while, then she realizes it is uh, not <laughs> truly <laughs> a favorable thing, you know, this kind of uh, physical, sexual love. So, okay, then she uh, asked the Buddha to accept her as a disciple. She awakened, and then to become a nun even. And after that, she became a heart in no time. She competed with a nun. <laughs> to see who, who is faster become a heart. And she, she became first before him, supposed to. Yeah. Ah, yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's not because uh, Ananda was slower or less spiritual. It's just his destiny to serve the Buddha first. Okay, and to try to remember everything the Buddha said in the assembly, or whatever happened in the assembly, on all the spiritual uh, stories that happened within the Buddha's assemblies and disciples. Just like nowadays, you have miracle uh, events, you know, miracle stories, and all that. Before, there was no record player. Yeah, so somebody has to write it down or memorize it all. Ananda was. That was his job, you see? If he became Buddha too quickly, maybe he could not do this, yeah? Because he will lose his intellectual power, memory, uh, so that he can become more pure, become Buddha. So he has to continue to be so-called a little ignorant until after Buddha passed away. Yeah, after Buddha passed away, he became enlightened immediately and become a hut, okay, and become one of the successors. Uh, I was telling you that whatever good for the world, uh, good for other people, then I would do it no matter what. So I'm just new like you here, and I forgot that. I totally halfway forgot. Now I continue that.
Uh, Buddha, uh, please wait. I come back to you. They have prepared for me a room, you know, on the second floor. Uh, more comfortable, of course, with aircon. You know, it was a VIP kind of room, and they put all the some of the thing I need already there. Yeah, but when I first came here, the, immediately I say I don't stay in any of these rooms. I stay up on the roof. Just put me a tent up there, and I'll be fine. I like it. Okay, I like like a tent in the open air and put me a kitchenette there with something in case I need to have some, sometimes I don't like solid food, I just want to cook a little soup, rice soup or something. So that's what they did. But then they continue working until, uh, until before we begin our retreat. So I had to put up um, with the uh, second floor of the room, okay? And then it becomes so comfortable. <laughs> After you live there for a few days, you have aircon, hot, cold, whenever you want, and the uh, unsuit bathroom, toilet, and everything already put there for you, special shampoo, and special conditioner, and good smelling soap, oh, it's already nice, and bubble bath. Ah, oh, then I continue to stay, stay, stay. <laughs> I didn't want to leave. <laughs> This morning, uh, I forgot, and then I asked the heavens again, okay, I'm too tired to check it out, tell me, is it still better that I go upstairs, better for the people, or is it better I continue to stay here, which is comfortable? I didn't ask for it, you know, make an excuse for myself. I didn't ask for people did it for me, you see, I did not ask. <laughs> so, is that maybe... <laughs> Maybe heaven's will that I should stay here. Comfort, comfort. Because <laughs> upstairs on the roof only, only a tent, a big tent, with a table, you know, to work. It's actually like a prepare, like an office, and a sofa. Okay, no aircon, just a, maybe a heater, small one, or empty. Okay. And later on, I came back and I saw the mosquito screen all around. It's like a room again. I said, oh, no. Oh, no, terrible. I don't want that. I just want a tent. Okay, and all around empty. I like that. It's not like screen all in with door and all that. Even though it's just a mosquito door, I don't like it. And this is one more excuse for me to continue to stay in the comfortable aircon. I already made all the clothes beautiful, hangy. Easy for me to, to do anything. So easy. So another excuse to stay. That's why I keep staying a few more days and I didn't think about the roof anymore. Besides, they took away all my kitchenette stuff. Another excuse, okay? What should I do up there? I don't have anything to cook. No pan, no pot, no, no cooking stoves, no uh, bowls, no uh, spoon. I keep listing it, you know? You see that? I have nothing. Oh. <laughs> yeah, our minds like comfort, yeah? Even I like comfort, yeah? especially when you're older, you know? You have air con, it's warmer for your back, and it doesn't stiffen your legs, and all kinds of excuses I have, yeah, yeah. And, but then I suddenly, this morning, I was thinking, oh, maybe just a trick. I should go upstairs because that's my instinct. The first day I came, I said, I don't stay in any rooms. The room has been sleep in by people and used for years, you know, decades already. I should not stay there, even though I throw all the beds out already. Just have a new sofa in and an uh, office at, at the table and all the office stuff, a document to work. So it just looked like an um, office. One sofa and a table, empty chair like that. It's not much, and it was okay too, comfortable. Because uh, they normally use it just for bedrooms. Are you coming, you just see the big bed, <laughs> nothing else. And it feels suffocating, I, I don't like it, because the room is already small. You put a bed in there, you can't do anything else. Even you put a chair or something in it, feel, <gasps> it feels too crowded. So I throw all the beds out anyway already, and it's more comfortable. But this morning, suddenly, I wake up and say, oh no, maybe it's not too good to continue to stay here because I feel too relaxed. It's a relaxing room. It's a rest area, and my mind will not be set on working. <laughs> it's the atmosphere in the bedroom. It always makes you feel relaxed and want to sleep. 
rest, you know. Ay, ay, ay. Especially when I didn't ask for it, you know. Maybe heaven's will, you know. <laughs> uh, this morning I asked. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm too lazy to move again. All my things up upstairs again. Uh, but okay, what is better for my work, okay, for the world? And they say, move, <laughs> leave this room. <laughs> I say, what? Really? Repeat again. <laughs> <laughs> so they say, leave the room. <laughs> uh, it's better, okay? Better for you, my work, yeah? So immediately I left, immediately, at that minute. Yeah, I don't want to further arguing with my mind. I know it is the right thing. It's my first impression anyway, and my first I wanted to do that. My ten is still up there, okay? And uh, so I move uh, whatever necessary. I couldn't move the whole thing yet because there are clothing. And, uh, but I move the symbolic of work, like computer, yeah, telephone, uh, bathroom stuff, uh, you know? Uh, toothbrush and stuff like that, and uh, and a blanket, yeah. So that is already a symbol of my new life, <laughs> a new area. It's all the necessity, and there's some clothes, yeah. So it's okay. The mind can trick you mm, for comfort. I really feel very comfortable in that room. Often. I can't sleep very well, but in that room I sleep so well and I feel peaceful there. That's why I didn't want to leave. I thought it's heaven's will. <laughs> Blaming it on heaven. It's not true. Sometimes a comfortable place doesn't mean a good place. Okay? You might not have peace at the end. Not peace within yourself only, but peace with other coordinating people. If you stay in one bedroom, for example, and to work from your bedroom, if you have no choice, and you have to, but if you have choice, you should separate your work and your sleeping area. Now, feng shui wise, it's like that. Because your sleeping area is your sleeping area. And if you work from there, people don't cooperate with you. It's just naturally, because uh, you order from your bedroom. Your bedroom is supposed to be your sleeping area, resting area. It's not for working. So at home, if you don't have more room, you have to put aside one corner for working, okay? Yeah, and when you finish work, you just shut that down. And if you can, you put a curtain or something, okay? Put something separate or some plants, so that you have more efficiency in your work. There are more of this kind of cooperation between colleagues. Of course, I was too comfortable. I even forgot all about feng shui or whatever shui that was. <laughs> I just feel so good. Sleep well, you know, eat good. <laughs> oh, for a long time, for a change. I was really reluctant to leave. Imagine that. A supreme Master and all. <laughs> Still like the bedroom. <laughs> all right. But I moved immediately as long as heaven reminds me for what purpose. I was here, it's okay, just a few days. Good excuse, yeah, take a rest. Okay, forgive me, <laughs> weakness <laughs> of the body and mind. <laughs> so I'm not always tough as you think, huh? I also love comfort, yeah, and uh, how you say, security, yeah. In the, in the second floor with the bedroom, is more secure, because there are iron doors, you know, locked and everything. The roof don't have any like that. But I have tried to fix it so that I can lock from my side. Normally they put lock all, only from the inside, okay? The roof's supposed to be the outside. So every lock, every door is locked from inside, not on my side, the roof. So this uh, day I moved up and I have tried to nail this and that and <laughs> making some arrangements so that I can lock from my side, just so that I can feel a little bit psychological safety. I had to do that wherever I go, so that I feel peace of mind. Huh? Good, now you know my secret, my uh, attachment secret to the bed and comfortable and the air con. Yeah, now I have nothing, <laughs> just a tent. No air con up there. <laughs> yeah, what for you have an air con? It's all open air anyway, <laughs> the air con will not work. But after a while, I get used to it also, you know, you will not feel that cold. 
It'll be okay. Just put more clothes on then. Huh? It is cold. It's good like that. So I can have more sympathy with you also, who lives in the outdoor tent and stuff like that. Huh? So I don't be too comfy huh? and sleep. So the Buddha say, mind that even if a prostitute who has no spiritual intention at all, or never had any uh, connection with any spiritual teaching prior to meeting with Ananda at that time, still she can become a nun and attain a hardship. That's a big deal, a hardship, very high, bodhisattva. Therefore, how can you not? That's what he meant, okay? His assembly, yeah. And you also, of course. The Buddha continued. Oh, my God. Has nothing to do with the precept, and I keep talking, huh? And you don't stop me even. Huh? You're supposed to stop me when I blow on. <laughs> enjoy my attachment to my bedroom. <laughs> enjoy, enjoy my weakness, yeah? I confess to you and you enjoy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I hope I don't have any more of this story to tell you to enjoy. <laughs> that was my weakness. I also love good food. Yeah, I love Indian chapati, roti, and these uh, fresh chutney, you know, they made it oh, with all kind of spice and flavor. Oh, when it's fresh, it's like heaven. <laughs> the chutney you bought from the shop is nothing compared to that. You know, when they make it, chop the, you know, there's a carrot into finger size and uh, other kind of vegetable, even, uh, you know, cauliflowers. And, and then they put, oh, I don't know what kind of spice they put it. Oh, God, it tastes so good. Even I forgot my dignity, I come and beg for some. <laughs> And they give me just a little bit because they prepare it for everybody. Uh, normally, they wouldn't give it to you before is uh, everybody, but they, I don't know, they feel I was too skinny, too small, so they feel pity for me. And the woman gave me some. <laughs> I never forget that taste because <laughs> I was hungry and also it tastes so good. And fresh, you know, freshly prepared. It's not too sweet, not too sour, not too salty. It's just perfect. The Indian woman, they can make it. Oh, man. And here, even you make it here, it's not the same. Okay? They put all the love in it also because for their gurus and the disciples who came to their house. Oh, they make it so good. All right, all right. Mm. <laughs> mm. I don't look like a nun or monk anymore, but I really ate only once today. <laughs> when you eat only once a day, you're not as hungry as when you eat more time. It's funny. The less you eat, the less appetite. The less you eat, the less you want. Uh, if you eat breakfast already, then lunch and dinner taste good. But if you eat nothing in the morning, uh, nothing else, then the, f the meal you taste, no matter when, it don't taste as good. Therefore, you don't even eat a lot. You don't feel such a taste, tasty like as if you had your breakfast first, and then many hours have lunch. If you have no breakfast, uh, you just eat, but you don't feel. It feels okay, but not, <laughs> no big deal. Mm. Now, the Buddha continue, and uh, those in the final age who wish to sit in a body manda, meaning sit in the meditation, yeah, the enlightening meditation method, yeah, sit in that way, not just sit, but really have a purpose a method, uh, a goal, and a truly deep understanding of why you're sitting. Otherwise, you just sit, no use. Mm. There's one more advice for you. If you want to sit longer without moving much, you have to sit full lotus. Uh, yeah? I cannot do it here because it's, uh, it's not very favorable here. If you sit in a full lotus position, you can sit longer. Although it might be uncomfortable at first, yeah? But after a while, you get used to it. See it or not? <laughs> okay. 
I will take a photo or something in lotus position, and then you can have a look. You know, right? That both legs are crossed together. Yeah. It's a little hard at first, but you get used to it. Not because of sitting in lotus position you will become Buddha, not like that, but you're more stable. Huh? And if, even if you, you meditate this way, you, you, you will not fall. <laughs> Your legs are locked, yeah? so you don't fall too, too easily. Yeah? And you can't sleep too easily. Mm. Even if you sleep uh, in the lotus position, you wake up earlier, quicker. All right, so let's just, by the way, yeah. so the Buddha say if uh, those in the final age, meaning, what mean final age? Mean the age that the Buddha is not, no longer there, yeah? After a master passed away 300 years or 500 years maximum, that is the final age of any teaching. If you don't see another master appear in that area, in that era, this is final. Hmm? Okay. But luckily we always have. It's just that it might not happen in that lineage. So you might think, oh, Buddha is gone forever. The teaching and the lineage of the spiritual power of any master is like a river. Sometimes it's hidden under the earth somewhere, and you thought this is the end of the river. No, no. It will seep out somewhere and then appear again. Huh? So it's just like that. Mm. Any of the religious people should look where the river reappears and do not be attached to a location of the original river. Because in all age, all religious branch, there will always be a master somewhere, and not be in the same lineage, not be in the same religious order, but there will be a master for the world, for our world, yes. And even in hell, there is a master called Kristigaba Bodhisattva. He will stay there forever because he vowed before he became enlightened. He vowed that he will save all the people in hell. He vowed that he will stay there forever until the hell are empty, all hells are empty. Uh, he said, if all hells are not empty, he will not take on the Buddha's position or fruit. He won't become Buddha if all hells are not empty. So he continued to stay in hell to teach the hell beings, whoever he can teach, whomever he still has enough, a little bit of spiritual inclination, he would teach them. And then slowly he bring others also to the understanding of the truth, and then continue further teaching, and then release their karma, or because of that, their karma will be lessened or cleansed, and then they can reincarnate as a human being, or a diva, or ashura, and then continue further. Yeah. That is Kristigaba Bodhisattva. Oh, there are endless sutras in Buddhism I like very much. Maybe one day I will read you this Kristigaba Sutra. Yes, it's very interesting. He talked about... Uh, When I uh, first uh, became a nun in Taiwan, and one of the temple, because we met where I took the precepts, so they invited me to their temple. And uh, the monks and nuns, normally, many of them, they go out to recite the sutra when somebody dies, and their relatives invite them to come recite sutra to, to help to liberate the soul of the dead for 49 days or some days at least, yeah, some weeks. And uh, these uh, monks and nuns also do that job, and they also asked me to come along. I also came. Of course, at that time, I cannot recite this sutra in Taiwanese, where I uh, recite Amitabha Buddha for them. It's fine. And they recite theirs. I just recite quietly, and the five names, yeah, at <laughs> that time. And later I saw they cook with uh, chickens and ducks and porks and stuff like that. So after their session, I call the monks and nuns at, in the temple. I call them and say, this is no, 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 no. You have to tell the people who don't understand that in the Kristigaba Sutra, you know, they call it Ti Chang Wang Pusa, mean the earth store bodhisattva, 
yeah, the one who vowed to save all hell beings before he became Buddha. That means forever, endless in this world. There will be always someone in hell. If nobody can save them all, then it's like that. I said, this is no, 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 no. Mm. If you go to recite sutra to somebody who died, you have to tell them, no, no meat. Yeah? Only vegetable. Otherwise, the soul of the dead will be having bad karma. Maybe have to go to hell for that. Or maybe delay, cannot go to heaven because of that. Maybe delay of liberation depends. So you have to tell them that. Uh, it says so in the Kristigaba Sutra. If any dead person, the relative, kill or offer meat and animals product in the name of the dead, the dead will be in trouble. Bad karma and may go to hell, may suffer more. Okay? So you have to tell them that. You have to bring the sutra and tell them that. And then they, they bow to me. <laughs> they put their arms together and say, You, Christi Gaba, Christi Gaba Bodhisattva. I said, No, no, no. I read Christi Gaba Sutra. I must remind you, we monks and nuns must tell people because they don't know. They have no chance to read any sutra. They're busy working. And they just go Buddha temple, you know, bow, bow, put some fruit and then take it back and eat. They never have chance to recite sutra. That's why we become monks and nuns. So we have more time to study the Buddha's teaching. And then because we are study already well, we must tell people who don't study it. It's not that you monks and nuns always go and just uh, reciting things and then take the offering from the red envelope and then go home. No, no, we study well because we have time, because we forsake the family time, we, for, we don't do business, we don't worry about mundane occupation, so we have more time. That's the, the, the purpose of being monks and nuns, so we can study a lot more. And then we have to tell people. And then they, they bow to me, <laughs> they say, I said, I'm Christi Gaba Bodhisattva. I said, no, no, I'm no Bodhisattva, I just study <laughs> the sutras. And then they were very respectful. I said, from now on, you tell people in advance before you come. He said, if you want me to come recite uh, the sutra to bless the deceased, you must cook vegetarian. Otherwise, I don't come and tell them why. Yeah. The Christi Gaba Sutra is very clear. Even uh, you give birth to the babies, and if the family member kill chicken and all that to give to mother, then it's very bad for both mother and son. Because those demons who love to smell the, the blood from the mother at the time of birth and all that, they're hanging around already, and they will uh, eat all this food also, and then they will make very much a heavy energy for the mother and son at the so sensitive time. They need more rest, more good energy, but they did all the wrong thing, all the opposite thing. It stay all in the Christi Gaba Sutra, and much more. In the Christi Gaba Sutra, it's even say that the Christi Gaba Bodhisattva tell the Buddha that, oh, I observe in the whole uh, physical world, all the beings, every little second, every little minute, nothing they think, nothing they do, doesn't cause karma for them. That bad. Therefore, you recite the five names all the time, okay? So that you don't think negatively. You don't have chance to act anything negatively. You protect yourself from attracting, so that you don't attract negativity to you as well. And bless your surrounding with this holy energy that you brought forth with you from the initiation power. So the Buddha say, those in the final age who wish to sit in a body manda, you know, enlightenment meditation, enlightening meditation, must first hold the pure precepts of a bhikshu, of a monk, okay? 
And to do so, they must find as their teacher a foremost shramana who is pure in the precepts. You mean some of the monk-like, yeah? If they do not encounter a member of the Sangha who is truly pure, at least somebody like a, a lay person, but take the precepts, okay? Because Buddha has different precepts for different uh, kind of uh, disciples. 250 precepts, okay? But of course, some of them are light precepts. So you can, like, uh, can modify it a bit. Like, for example, in the Buddha's time, the nuns and monks take shower only every two weeks. Uh, that the Buddha say you can modify it. He told Ananda like that. Okay, uh, many other are more strict. Yeah, some I cannot tell you because you are not amongst the nuns. Okay, I just tell, uh, that is a simple I, I can tell, but many more I cannot. Or like if you eat uh, in the assembly, you you take the from public kitchen food or offering, you don't cover the vegetable with rice, or you don't cover the rice with food, meaning you just do proportionately what you need. Because sometimes if you like more vegetable, okay, then you try to cover the rice so that people don't see how much vegetable you take. Or you don't try to cover the vegetable on top of the rice so the people don't know how much rice you take, because you love that kind of rice. Rice is not always white rice. Indian, they have delicious rice. That's why. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. Mm. This kind of precept, uh, the Buddha says some light precept, you can modify like that kind, okay? Uh, further, I cannot tell you. I'm not allowed to. Uh, you're not allowed to hear the bhikkhu, monks, nun precept if you are not monks and nun. Because if you know it, you have to keep. Also very difficult. Hmm? Many precepts are difficult for lay people, okay? Because the monks and nuns, they're not supposed to have any uh, man-woman relationship, for example, like that, yeah? So there are many precepts for that, and you can't keep it. It's difficult. It's very detailed and sensitive hmm? also. I can't tell you. You should not know <laughs> unless you want to become monks and nuns. Officially, then you take the precepts and hold it, okay? Yeah. Keep it. And well, right now, you keep these five precepts that the Buddha explained. That's good enough, okay? And the five names and the gifts, if I have given you, okay? That's secure you to go to heaven. All right? So the Buddha emphasized again, again, and again. So the Buddha say, in the final age, mean when the Buddha already in Nirvana, if anybody wants to follow this kind of meditation, yeah, that he passed down to his uh, successor, then they have to find the, the, the teacher, a former shramana, is somebody lesser than monks, but keep the pure precepts. Like the monks and nuns, they have 250. And the one who take uh, bodhisattva precepts, maybe 10 precepts, yeah? but have to keep it very purely. 100% pure. And the other normal five precepts. Therefore, the Buddha said you have to find somebody, foremost one, to keep the pure precept, like the ten precepts. Okay? Uh, all, um, the A way of vegetarian, like last time I explained to you. Then that person can transmit the Dharma to you. Mm -hmm. Just like now, some of the residents can transmit the initiation to you. Why I am still alive, but don't have to be uh, present at the initiation place. And then the Buddha said, if they do not encounter a member of the Sangha who is truly pure, then it is absolutely certain that their deportment in precepts and rules cannot be accomplished. So that. If you want to practice, for example, the Kuan Yin method that the Buddha uh, transmitted, you have to find a pure monk or the pure bodhisattva layperson to transmit it to you. Otherwise, uh, it's uh, not uh, valid. 
It doesn't help you, okay? It doesn't work. All right, now, after accomplishing the precepts, they should put on fresh, clean clothes, light incense in a place where they are alone, and recite the spiritual mantra spoken by the Buddha of the mind 108 times. The one that the Buddha tell you. Actually, in many sutra, there are many uh, mantra uh, re reciting by the Buddha, okay? Hey, guy, you cannot see me very well, huh? Hmm. Some of you, huh? Yeah, poor thing. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> if I stand up, then the people behind don't see me. <laughs> if I sit, then some people in front don't see me. Yeah, this is the life we have here, okay? <laughs> it is not perfect, yeah? But you are perfect. You will be perfect. And that's important. <laughs> the world can be perfect or not perfect, but we should be perfect. That's important, okay? Right. See, the Buddha always emphasized the precepts. Again here he said, after accomplishing the precepts, they should put on fresh, clean clothes, light incense, and recite the spiritual mantra spoken by the Buddha 108 times. Why is that? It's just one of those numbers, okay? 108 times so that you don't forget. After initiation, you might forget the five names. Just go somewhere, recite it, make sure you remember so that every day you continue to practice, so that your mind will be ingrained into this spiritual power already. Yeah? Not just uh, after initiation, immediately go out, chop, 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 chop something or uh, chat, chat, chat. Huh? Try to find your quiet, peace place. Continue reciting the five names. Remember refreshing yourself, the instruction and all the levels, landmarks, so that you won't forget. After that, they should secure the boundaries and establish the body manda. After you remember already, okay, then you must know that when you meditate, you should be alone in some secure place so that nobody see you, huh? Better. In the countries within them, they should seek for the unsurpassed thirst-come ones throughout the ten directions to emit a light of great compassion and anoint the crowns of their heads. In the countries within them. What does that mean? How can a country be within you or anyone? Huh? Okay. When you meditate, you are in different levels of consciousness. Maybe you pass through them, or maybe you contain them, or maybe you just remember all this landmark at the time of initiation, so you can recognize where you're going. The Buddha said to you, within them, within these countries, but within those countries, within you. That's why the Buddha say, in the countries within them, Within them, meaning these people, the one that he just mentioned, the one who practiced body manda. Same in the Bible. The Bible say, in my father's house, the many mansion. It's the same thing. Okay? So remember all that. <laughs> what? Can I uh, relate something with you? Tell, Tell me. me. Because you just say contain something. And what is happening in the last uh, four months? Mm. I always uh, assimilate uh, five names. Mm. With uh, one time was uh, two masters, then three masters. Now it's four masters, including oh. you, and God. And God is the one that contains all of them. And every time that I recite them, now it's I, I am right into that circle mm. myself. Mm. And when I'm in that circle, I I don't know nothing else. Of this world, right? And, okay. Yes. It's, you in Samari, yeah, it's good. Yeah, you mentioned that contain, and it, it's it like that. Make a yes, sense. Yeah. yes. What the Buddha Thank say you. here is, in the countries within themselves. You see what I mean? Within you, within those people who practice after initiation. 
He didn't say in the country, in their country, or in the heavens, or they say within them. All the masters speak the same language, yeah. In my father's house, there are many mansions, okay? The kingdom of God is within you, see, the Buddha say, all the countries within them, meaning the spiritual level of practice within them, okay? Then they should seek the Buddhas, they should seek the blessing of the first come ones, meaning all the Buddhas, in the ten directions to shy great compassion light toward them, toward these practitioners, and anoint the crown of their heads. Yeah. Bless them. Ananda, when any such pure big shoes, Oh, now, bhikshunis, he also saying that now, meaning female monks, yeah. When any such pure monks and nuns or white rope donors in the Dharma ending age who can rid their minds of greed and lust, hold the Buddha's pure precepts and in a body manda make the vows of a bodhisattva and can bathe upon entering each time and day and night for three weeks without sleep, continue this practice of the way. I will appear before these people in a physical form and rub the crowns of their heads to comfort them and enable them to become enlightened. The Buddha will manifest just like transformation body, yeah? Even though it looks like physical body, but it's not the Buddha in physical body anymore. So the Buddha said that after initiation, if you secure your place and you do practice for three weeks long without sleeping, like, uh, I guess, a retreat for three, three weeks, and keep the pure precepts, no sleep. <laughs> I don't think I should tell you this because <laughs> it's your specialty. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. So the Buddha say, if they can do that, the Buddha will really appear to them and help them, rub in the head and help them to become enlightened. What is? I want to tell you actually that you did that for me. And if? When I first decided to initiate right after I got the convenient method, I was having trouble understanding how to feel here mm -hmm. and I was trying to meditate and I sort of fell asleep and I had a vision and you walked up to me and you handed me some cream mm -hmm. and you said oh well just rub this on your forehead and mm -hmm. it'll work mm -hmm. and after that always every time I meditate I could feel okay and and yeah. you still have doubt whether or not I'm a master thank you very much <laughs> no no that's not what I meant master <laughs> I mean not now but I mean if uh, some some days ago or some there's some always the small part. the mind yeah, there's yeah. always the small part but yeah. not in the heart master of course of course I know that otherwise you wouldn't be here right right thank you master. <laughs> it's just the mind tricking you but your soul knows your that's intelligence right. knows yeah. yeah that's why I told you you are a smart boy you don't need to ask what is the proof or what is what. No need, you know it, okay? Okay, right. thank you, Master. Don't let the mind trouble you and rob you of your enlightenment and faith. Yeah. Faith is the mother of all virtues, that's what I said. Yeah? Buddha said that, the same. Jesus said, blessed are the one who do not see but believe. Because for them is the kingdom of God because they're pure, you know? Maybe their karma blind them not to see vision or light for that period of time, temporarily, but they believe in the Master teaching. They still inherit the kingdom of God. They still go to heaven, okay? Yeah. All right, thank you for telling me that. You look fatter today. Did you eat a lot or something? <laughs> no, I mean, you, your face are rounder, kind of more relaxed. Maybe it's your blessing, Master. I don't know. <laughs> okay. But thank you. Yeah, I don't mean about eating, but your face looks more round, you know, more lovely. Yeah. More soft, soft. I, I meditated well last night. Good, I guess. good. Yeah. yeah, you can see that. More restful. Very smooth, yeah? Smooth. Face, smooth. Energy, smooth. <laughs> thank you. Congratulations. So, Buddha continued. Ananda said to the Buddha, now Ananda talked. Were honor one, 
enveloped in the thus come one's unsurpassed compassionate instruction, my mind has already become enlightened. And I know how to cultivate and be certified to the path beyond learning. But for those who cultivate in the final age and want to establish a bodhimanda, how do they secure the boundaries in accord with the rules of purity of the Buddha? The world honor one. Yeah. So the Buddha said to Ananda, if there are people in the Dharma ending age who wish to establish a bodhimanda, they should first find a powerful, oh, this is a very long story. Mm. If you want to build yourself a bodhimanda, okay, the meditation retreat kind of place, yeah, secure, peaceful, so no disturbance, meaning you be away from your family and your job or your usual uh, surrounding, then you have to build a place for yourself. The Buddha said here how, but I don't think you can, so I don't know if I skip it or not. I don't think you can do all this. <laughs> you have to find a white ox who eat only grass in the Himalaya, <laughs> for example. If he's not a white ox, it's not okay. If he doesn't eat the grass in the Himalaya, then his excrement will not be pure enough for you to use it, to mix with the earth and to make a platform and a wall for you. In the Himalaya, in the region of Himalaya, people use a cow's dung, ox dung, to mix with the mud in order to to pasture their wall. Actually, they just use a pure cow dung to pasture around on the outside of the wall, and, and then they meditate in there or they live in there. Mostly it's for the meditator, they do that. Also, it, um, uh, this kind of uh, very effective to prevent mosquitoes and insects to come in your house. Yeah? It's funny. It's like that. Huh? It's, it's antibacteria. Yes, and it's they, very safe. They do that on the floor before eating the food. Yeah, also, yes. They clean the house and all that, and then they plaster it with cow's dung. But it must be pure cow dung, okay? Because if the cow eating all kind of uh, not pure food or garbage outside, that might not be effective, at least psychologically or spiritually, yeah? People use cow dungs a lot in India. They use it for cooking, yes, they use it for the floor. For, huh? It's good internal as well, yes, yes, yes. Any? Yes, some, Any. some people use it to cure their sickness. Yes, some people cut the cow dung fresh yes. and consume it as well. This is for you, Westerner and other people, it seems like uh, something you should not do, but that's what they do, and it really helps. Well, at least it help them. I never try, so I cannot guarantee to you. You can try and tell me. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, they use it to prepare some kind of spiritual initiation platform, and, uh, and mostly they smear around their house, outside of the wall, you know, inside also and outside, and then they paint it on. Yeah, it's what you said about um, Gomata, the cow being so pure. Everything from the cow is used. And in Srimad Bhagavad Gita, it's also said that the medicinal purposes, they use it in all medicines, mm. because everything from the cow yeah. is sacred. Yeah. And it was Lord Krishna's favorite animal. Yeah. So everything they use, the fuel and the gopis who used to move with Lord Krishna, yeah. everything would yeah. be a cow dung. Long time ago, I told some of residents, I don't know if it's recorded, I told some of the residents that the cows are from the fifth level. Did you ever hear? Yes. Is it recorded? Yes. Oh, okay. Maybe that's the reason. The Indian practitioners, the pure people, they knew the origin of the cow. Maybe that's why they worship the cows in India, you know that? I mean, most people, not all nowadays. Yes, sir? 
exactly doing organic farming using cow urine. Like they have 10, 15 cows together. Uh -huh. Instead of watering the plant, they use cow urine as an organic farming. Yeah, okay. They use many things of the cows and they worship the cows too. When they see the cow, I saw some Hindu people, they go and touch the cow and touch their forehead. They touch the cow's feet and touch their forehead. It's as if you prostrate to the cow's feet. If you touch somebody's feet and touch your forehead, it's a sign of respect, correct? It is part of a tradition to, uh, for a woman to, after get married, uh, she actually feeds cow for a certain number of days to have safety of the husband. Oh, very good, wonderful, wonderful. You see that? So I have always told you that a country, rich or not, materially doesn't matter too much. But spiritually rich, it matters, yeah? And some people who are not used to the Indian tradition or Tibetan or I mean uh, Asian tradition, they think what they're doing, uh, you know, superstitious, it's not like that. Just because they don't see with spiritual eye what the people are doing or what the animals are or what the trees are. Just like one of your brother, he touched a tree and he fell. This like uh, electric currents or something that uh, respond to him, yeah, in blessing and love. You mentioned about the cow, uh, how spiritual it is. And there's a book uh, that I read many years ago before I knew you, and the book it's uh, to know yourself. Mm. And halfway in the book, there was this figure as a, a cow, mm. and and uh, I read it, the whole book, and at the end of the book says. If I see the the, the figure, you seen the figure yourself. And I, I didn't. No, I didn't. So I went back oh. and read it, and that's when I see it. Oh, I see, I see the figure in the book, and probably it was that that uh, that when you know yourself, uh -huh. you, you see yourself as oh. as the cow. Oh, I see. Understand. Understand. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't grow any no. horn yet, <laughs> after, so I don't know so if you're a cow or not. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> you. Okay. So anyway. The people who know the spiritual dimension of animals or trees, they worship them. And then we, sometimes ignorant, uh, civilized, uh, educated people, thinking, oh, that's just, uh, you know, they worship uh, things, it's not worthy, and stuff like that, okay? They worship mountain, river, they all have goddesses in there. The river have gods, the mountain have gods, and they're all blessing people all the time. It's just we don't see it. If you, oh, actually, well. if you actually see the picture of the cow, there are all the gods and goddesses painted on each part of the body of the cow. That's oh, Indian see that? Mm. And, and the government of India is banning slaughtering of the cows, and the government already banned animals yeah. uh, in the zoo and everything. I, I saw, saw some. Supreme Master yeah. TV. Very good. And uh, mm. Supreme Master is uh, doing ma donating money to take care of those people who are suffering. Mm. Supreme Master donating? Yes, yes. I donate it. Yes. <laughs> Just you are, you are It's the same. Uh, we donate it, okay. Yes, yeah, so $85,000. Right. Thank, Thank yeah. you, Master. Uh, it's okay. No, no, it, we should. All of us should do that, okay? Not just Supreme Master TV. But I do what I can, only one person. <laughs> All right. Hey. Yeah, tell. They announced officially that in India more people will become vegan. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course they should. So it's very beautiful. Yeah, Just India is ago. supposed to be a spiritual country. The most, they, yeah. they should be back to the origin, you know. Originally they were like that. Yes, yes, Master. M most of the NRIs like me who are staying here, who settled in America, they are doing whatever they could do, like constructing the water tanks and providing yeah. uh, mosquito-free zones and electricity. And now it has reached to so many people and people are not waiting for the government to respond. They are doing yeah. whatever they, they, they could do. And, and yeah. uh, all the political leaders are also mobilizing NRIs. They're actually coming here and asking money from us and uh, taking that money back and showing the accounts properly. It is done, mis it's not misused. So there's a lot of change and awareness. Very good. Actually, Indians should do that, because Indians are supposed to be the credit of spirituality. All the masters, mostly from India, and some master had went to India to study and then came back to teach their country people. <laughs>
Yeah. There are a lot of loving hut restaurants in India. And um, I was actually doing translation of uh, all these things into my lo local language, Telugu. So I, I do not have a job for the last one and a half year. Oh. So after I started doing translation, I got three jobs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I picked the one most I, I like most. And uh, uh. With, with your abundant blessings, my entire family is uh, initiated. And uh, so we, we, we are so happy. And all the problems are taken without even asking your help. Mm. So I just want to have a question if, with your permission. I want to ask. My son is initiated when he was 11 years old, yes. so 12 years old. Now he's 16 years old and he believes you very much and he does meditation. And recently he has been influenced by the school. He's going to high school. He's in high school. He's going to college next year. Mm. So everything he's thinking in terms of scientific reasons, saying, oh, vegan diet is not good, not proteins oh, are right. not there. And uh, it is because I'm studying well, I'm passing all these Understand. exams. It is not because of master, things yeah. like that. <laughs> and my, my wife is 100% diligent practitioner, and she is having a big uh, fight with him. And uh, uh, so we, we, we try to see... You don't supply him with the, the, like the scientist's evidence and the doctor's evidence from America? No, he does all that. He goes to Google and shows me something. I go to Google and show him something, then... Uh, <laughs> Then, then the last week, and we we had an argument. He he got out of the car and he ran away. Then I got I got call call the police and bring him back and oh, all kinds of. Oh, let it be. Yeah, should we go easy on him or tough on him? That's what we our dilemma is. Uh, let it be, okay? Yeah. Because uh, teenager they are yeah, rebellious yeah. in yeah. nature. You know, they hate you for nothing. Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> they do everything against you, and they feel cool about right. that. So yes, let it yes. be. Okay. He'll cool down. Sure. Thank you. Okay. It's just sometimes the society is stronger than one family. That's the problem. It's very sad. You know, sometimes it happens. Don't worry. Let it be. Okay. Let me pray for him. Meditate for him. Share with him your marriage. He'll be fine. Okay. In China, they say. The society is a big dying top, so we always get in this uh, different color and wrong color. He, he's actually very good by heart. He does five precepts, and uh, yeah. his, uh, all his friends in his class they, they they take my son's lunchbox and eat vegan food every day. Mm. So, <laughs> so he's, he he feels like he's a hero promoting vegan food. Oh, uh, then it's good, all right. Yeah, so that, let him yeah. be. Let it be. Okay. Right. Yeah, Thanks. he could have. Okay. Ananda, when such, any such monks and nuns or why rob it donor, meaning the, the lay people who keep the five precepts, normally they would wear white robe when they see the Buddha, okay, to symbolize their purity and devotion to the Buddha. They are almost like nuns, it's just a lesser degree. They uphold some precepts, like the eight precepts, ten precepts, the eight uh, vegan way, or the five precepts. They call them white robe, uh, lay people. At the Dhamma ending age, who can rid their minds of greed and lust, hold the Buddha's pure precepts, and in a body manda, make the vows of the Bodhisattva, etc., etc. I already read that. So Ananda asked how people will be able to stabilize himself in body manda, meaning meditation on the enlightened way. So uh, the Buddha say you have to find a cow dung. You have to first find a powerful white ox in snowy mountains and one that eats the lush and fertile, sweet-smelling grasses of the mountains. Since such an ox also drinks only the pure water, of the melted snow river water. Its excrement will be very fine. They can take that, mix with the sand and wood, and plaster the ground with it, etc., etc. There's some more work to do, but I don't think you need it. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking whether or not I read all this to you. Because you have to... Uh, have to find also incense, and you have to... Because the Buddha say, if it's not in the snowy mountains, then the ox excrement will stink, 
and cannot be used to smear on the ground. In that case, select a level place, dig down five feet or so, and use that yellow earth. Also good. Have to be five feet under the surface of the earth. Then the, the, the soil there will be pure. I don't think I can recommend all this to you. <laughs> because you only want to rely on master power to go to the fifth level. <laughs> and I think more than that, I can't ask you. India is a different place. When people devoted to the Buddha, they really do. And they go to all ends. And they really want to... <laughs> and they want to become a Buddha and all that. Uh, you just want to sit here, listen to me talking with the calendar, and clap, and happy, go home, do your business as usual, and pray to a master, and that's all you can do, I think. And eat vegan, of course. <laughs> but the rest, I don't think, yeah. I don't think you're that eager to become Buddha, the way that the Buddha recommended, if you whatever you want to do if you want to become a, truly a Buddha and Bodhisattva. I don't think I can ask much of you like that. Or can I? Yes? yes. yes. No? Yes. You really want to find a white ox in the Himalaya mountain and smear their dungs on your ground in the wall and then sit there for three weeks on end? Can you do that? <laughs> yeah, forget it. <laughs> I don't need to ask, <laughs> okay? Three weeks, no sleep. Of course you can, I know that. <laughs> I ask you if I can ask you to do that, you say, yes, you can, Master, of course. <laughs> okay. I have to confess to you, maybe I also cannot do that, okay? Mm. I have different way to reach whatever heavens I want to reach. And uh, this is for the Indian, okay? Mm. The one who rely on the Buddha and have to do this and that. In India, we can do that. In your country, maybe to find a white ox already difficult, yeah? <laughs> or to dig under the ground, five feet underground to find the yellow earth, a lot, a lot of them enough to make a platform for you and make the wall around you to sit there three weeks without sleeping. Just to talk about three weeks with, without sleeping, and no ox, no whites, no nothing yet. Can you? No. All right, then I don't read any further. <laughs> oh, my God. A lot, a lot of work here. Nevertheless, just pretend that you have done all the preliminary preparation you know, with the white ox duns and with the sweet eating grass and all that first, okay? And just pretend that you have done all that. And just pretend that you could go without sleep for three weeks. Okay, now I read further. Mm. And have you burned a lot of incense, etc., etc. And then the four sides of the wall, you have should suspend flags and flowers. And within the room where the platform located, should arrange on the four walls images of the thirst come ones and bodhisattvas of the ten direction. If you can find all their images, okay? That is pretend that you already done the, all the things that you say you can <laughs> or not can. And then you have to do all that as well. All the Buddha, Bodhisattva on the, all your walls. And then in the most prominent place, display image of Vairokana Buddha. I don't know if you can find that. And then Shakyamuni Buddha, that you can find. Matraya Buddha, you can. Uh, Amitabha Buddha, you can. In all the magnificent transformation of Kuan Yin Bodhisattva as well if you can find them. Mm. To the left and right place the Vajra treasury bodhisattvas. Beside them display the Lord Chakra and Brahma, Akshuma, and Blue Diga, as well as Kundali and Brukuti and all four heavenly kings with Vinayaka to the left and right of the door. All this because you don't find a living master. You study with uh, his disciple or some lay, later generation disciple, if they still uh, have 
the instruction in their heart to tell you. Then, because the living master, meaning the Buddha is not there anymore, you have to do such and 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 such, such. Then you can also become enlightened, and the Buddha will appear to you and bless you to be enlightened. That is that. So, the living master is easier way for you if you can find one. There are some more. <laughs> so many Buddha image and Bodhisattva and heavenly being already. Some more coming. In case you want to try. Yeah. Then suspend eight mirrors in the space around the platform so that they are exactly opposite the mirrors on the platform. Can you remember all that? No. This will allow the reflections in them to interpenetrate at infinitum. And during the first seven days, bow sincerely to the thirst come ones of the ten directions. Every day, bow, non-stop. To the great bodhisattvas and to the names of the ahats, if you know all of them, okay? If you can find their names in any sutra or by any chance. But that was just uh, almost immediately a few hundred years after Buddha died, after the Buddha Nirvana. Now it's too far away already. It's very difficult to trace down all these names of Buddha Bodhisattva, even if you want to. So a living master is the best, okay? Find one. Mm. <laughs> it's just because the living master are the, the transmitter directly of enlightenment and blessing. After the living master is gone, the energy diminished as days go by, years go by. So you have to find the living pole who still holds this energy of enlightenment and blessing direct from heaven to give it to you. Only if you don't have a lighter, that you have to rub the stones together or do whatever, you know, <laughs> very hard in order to make fire. If you have a match box, match and lighter, do you still need to do that? No, no find the match box, find the lighter, okay? Chuck, quick, immediately you have, you can light a candle with it, make fire with it. Okay. But nevertheless, I read it all to you. I cut some already. It's very cumbersome and a lot of work to do. I just read some, some parts so that you know already that it's almost impossible. Yeah, you want to become Buddha when you don't have a guru. Well, that's how you have to do. And it's not the end of it yet, okay? <laughs> ah, that the first seven days you have to do that. Now you don't know uh, the name of the, all the Ahats, you know, the name of all his disciples who has become Ahat. You don't know them anymore, okay? You don't know the name of Varukana Buddha, for example. You don't even know where to find his image. At that time when the Buddha almost uh, just uh, uh, lived for Nirvana, they still have all this with his disciples or descendants of disciples. So, Throughout the six periods of the day and night, continually recite the mantra as your circle mumbulate the platform. Practice the way, you know, this method, with a sincere mind, reciting the mantra 108 times as a stretch. Not just the first day, but continue. All the six periods of the day, doing this and that. And then, during the second week, Direct your intent by making the vows of a bodhisattva. The mind should never be cut off from them. In my Vinaya, I have already taught about vows in some of his teaching. He talked about how to make vows for, uh, to become a bodhisattva, okay? If, if your intention to become a bodhisattva, how much vow you have to make, how resolute you have to make up your mind with. That's why he didn't mention here again the Bodhisattva vows, okay? During the third week, one holds the Buddha's mantra, Bodhala, for 12 hours at a time. Can you do that? Non-stop. 
Okay. With a single intent. And on the seventh day of the third week, yeah, the thirst come once of the ten directions will appear simultaneously. Some of you don't do anything like that. And you see the Buddha, the Jesus, even, <laughs> just by sitting after eating a dinner from the public kitchen. <laughs> so having transmission from a living master is the quickest way. The lazy people can do it. Yeah? I'm not talking about you, I mean any lazy people. I don't mean you're lazy, sorry. Don't mean to offend you. <laughs> you're good, good. Very diligent. <laughs> so they will appear to you if you do all that for three weeks long, non-stop, single-mindedly, bowing, reciting, meditating, praying, and incense, and etc., 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 and all this formula at one time. If you can even afford to do that in our busy lifestyle nowadays, so the Buddhas will come and their light will be mutually reflected in the mirrors and will illumine the entire place. And they will rub one on the crowns of one's head. Some of you never know anything like this, don't even, even heard about it, and still have a lot of Buddha's lights you see in, <laughs> everywhere. Yeah? Some of you, so, all right, then you know it. If one cultivates this samadhi in the body manda, then even in the dharma and in age, one can study and practice until one's body and mind are as pure and clear as viduria. I guess something very pure. What is that in Sanskrit? Viduria, you know? Any Indian people? As pure as Vaiduria. What, Vaiduria is, is a stone master. A stone? Yeah, it's a stone, but stone. What kind Indian of? Indian but stone. Oh, is it clear and transparent? It's yes. like crystal, something like yes, that? Yes, yes. Okay, got that. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. That is the mature state of a diamond. Oh, okay. After the Vaiduria, it becomes a diamond. Oh, yeah. All yeah. right. That's cool. You want to ask something so, so urgently? When I was listening to you at first talk about the different Buddhas and the way to become a Buddha and uh -huh. to go through all of these different rituals, and uh, I was going to say that um, what you've said, a living master, having you as a master, we can bypass all of these rituals because we can't get to those points anyway. If you can't find all of this, it's, it's no, you don't have time for loose ends. But mm -hmm. we have you as a living master. And everybody needs a living master to achieve what we're trying to do. Yeah. And so that was the point. But then okay. you started touching on these things and mm. cleared that up. All right. Thank you for your opinion. A valuable advice. Thank you. Yeah, that's what it is. Yes. <laughs> the Indian people, they know this inside out. Every sutra, every... Uh, book of Vedas emphasize always oh, living master, living master, living master. <laughs> in, in those days, the gurus are very few. You can count on fingers. That is why all these procedures are available. Right now, we have uh, the Himalayas is right here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Except no snow. <laughs> all right, love. All right, love. I was uh, wondering why you Indian come all the way to Taiwan to find your guru. <laughs> That's the quality matter, master, not quantity. Uh, we have it in India, yes, okay. Uh, we don't want to say any comparison, okay? This might be offending. All the gurus should be respected. It depends on, on your level, you know? If you are not uh, ready to a higher dimension or teaching, then you, you, you cannot uh, just... <laughs> Uh, blame any master. Master, I was told by uh, the holy man that I met, he told me that he, in his own life, he was fortunate enough to meet five enlightened masters. Uh -huh. And then, when I, I just spontaneously said, can I meet five too? And he closed his eyes and he said, now they're gone, there's only one. He told me very clearly, there is only one. Oh, 
one, meaning there's only one enlightened, fully enlightened master in the world. Where is I that? Guess, I guess you. Oh, <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Whoever told you that, I, <laughs> I want to ask him where. <laughs> well, thanks to your master, huh? He is a good one. All right. If you believe that, it's good for you. If you have proof for that, good for you. If you don't have proof for that, don't, don't blame me. Huh? <laughs> my previous master knows you, master. Who? Uh, my, my previous master, which we, whom we discussed with you, Brahmarshi Patriji, Pyramid Spiritual Society. He is a Buddha's meditation master. Oh. He knows, and I still meet him whenever he comes to USA. He, he stays in my house. He knows me? Uh, you know him, he knows you. Oh. So you have seen his picture and you told oh. him who he was. And uh -huh. uh, So last time when I met him and he said, myself and my wife, these, are, these two are uh, Supreme Master Ching Hai's favorites. Oh. And, and uh, he actually asked me to invite you to India. Uh, and actually, they, uh, every year uh, from December 21st to December 31st, every year they do a group meditation with 100,000 people. Oh. So they, they construct pyramids at the scale of 5,000 to 6,000 people can sit inside. He actually asked me to invite you oh. to India. So every, every three months, so he, he, they actually publish uh, Supreme Master Ching Hai's vegan diet and all those things in their magazines. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> wow. Thank him a lot. and. Tell him that uh, I really, really appreciate his invitation. It's official now, she said. That right. uh, official now, Indian goes vegan, okay? Right. All right, please tell your master that uh, I pay respect and thank, I, I really thank, thank him. Thank you, master. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, all right. There are so many master. It's, it's easier for you to choose now. They actually believers of the cosmic energy, which is which is produced through pyramid, like Giza pyramid. So all the disciples, most of them, whoever has little bit money, they buy, they build a small pyramid, because the cosmic energy is is built at 45 degrees. Yes. Uh, th that's the reason even Giza pyramid is is uh, is giving energy to the earth. Yes, yes, yes. That's why they build the pyramid before, I have told in one of my lectures that there's a meditation place. Right. People just thinking, they don't know what, but I say... This. No, it, if, if you sit inside a pyramid and do meditation, you achieve uh, samadhi in more three... Concentration. Quickly. Uh, just physically speaking, it's more protective. Right, yes. Yeah. And whatever negative power, it will disperse out, right. you know, in this uh, shape, yes. And uh, I told a long time ago, I don't know if it's recorded or not, that because some people ask me, what's a pyramid is for? Is it the tomb or something? I said, no, no, in the old time, people built it just to meditate. It's a meditation place. Yeah, now I... it's proved it. All right, okay. So do what you can to help yourself. Hmm? Hmm. But I don't think that the London people can build pyramid into their literal apartment. It's very expensive in London, for example, you know, Paris, you know. It's, it's, it's enough to put furniture inside and you zigzag your way through it. <laughs> yeah, we're more worried about the soul level, not, not the body level. That's why you are here for us, Master. All right. Thank good, you. Good. Oh, <laughs> thank you for your valuable information. Thank you, Master. That just confirmed what I said before. The pyramid is people built it for meditation. Everybody thinks it's a tomb or what is it inside. Nobody even know up to now what for. For meditation purpose, yeah? Number one is very good concentration inside, energy, okay? Also the cosmic energy can help you, okay? It's so one pointed like that, yeah? Okay, and then number two is that in the desert, it's so hot. The pyramid is very thick, you know, the wall diameter, very thick, and it's so cool inside, as if you stay in a normal... The, the basic reason pyramids were constructed is Egyptians believe that the person who dies, they will be be reborn again, that's why they use it to mummify the body and put it inside the pyramid. The body will be born again? Yeah, they, they actually wrap it in a chemical cloth yeah, yeah, and yeah, put yeah, it inside Yeah, but that pyramid. is just for the... Yeah, the, their belief is the person will, be, will take rebirth and use the same body. They use pyramids for that purpose. No, that's what people suspect. But it's just for meditation before. 
okay? And whatever, they wrap them in silk or in a mummy uh, kind of uh, substance, it's just it's their tradition, just to keep it, to preserve the body. Just like we nowadays, we want to keep the body in a coffin and bury it in some special place and build a little memorial, it's just so that we remember because we all want to be like eternally uh, in, the, in, in life. So they do anything they can just to preserve that concept. Yes? I wanted to ask a question about what you were reading before, if mm. that's okay. About when the Buddha was talking about how to get enlightenment without a master, the mm. cow and the mm. poop and the yes. no sleep. Did he mean, I wondered if he meant to say that, like, literally, as in doing these things will actually... Or did he mean it more like a parable no, as no, far no. as, like, the impossibility of, of finding enlightenment without a master? Maybe so also, yeah? But he really mean it. He really tell all it graphically, okay? But also, it's possible only because uh, his descendants, disciple, is still, is still there. It's the final age of his Dharma teaching. Not now. Not now anymore. Not after 2,700 years of his Nirvana. At that time, he, Buddha just passed away, final ending age about 500 years after he passed away. That's in other sutra he say that. Yes. For him, for his teaching lineage, end at 300, 500 years after. But not now anymore. Okay, even if you want to do it, it might not work. You don't find these pure monks and nuns who are still having this blood lineage in them anymore to transmit it to you, however little uh, diluted <laughs> is still there. After the Master dies, 300 or 500 years maximum, no more. That's why every sutra emphasizes living Master. Otherwise, uh, the Buddha was there and he tell people, okay, you just go and do that, no need me, no need the Buddha, okay? No, they all come and study with the Buddha. And he say it's a very rare you can find the Buddha, yeah, and the teaching when he's still alive. This is for his descendants' disciple, who still have pure, if they're pure in the precepts, and they had already the lineage is still going, not as strong as when the Buddha alive, because they, they transmitted like from the first uh, successor, yeah, from the Buddha, and then to the second successor of that successor, and the third successor of the successor, and so on and so forth. Just like after the tenth guru of the Sikh passed away, well, before that, he said, no more, no more gurus of the Sikh only study the scripture, because at that time, that's the best he can offer to his disciples, because he knows the nine master has gone, he's the last one, and there's no more bloodline, uh, no more spiritual bloodline to pass on to the next uh, generation. So he said, just study the scripture, it's the better than nothing. In the scripture, at least it's mentioned nam, mentioned precept, mentioned purity, mentioned God, devotion. The people who can follow that and attain some level of understanding of Godhood. And then maybe they're lucky they find living master. Okay? Yeah. Otherwise, the guru cannot cheat people and say, okay, after I die, uh, my wife, my son, my, my his son die anyway in the battle. Because at that time, the, the the king of that country and the people who believe in the king's uh, religion at that time, uh, chasing the master and, and, and harass them no end. And, you know, in the battle, his sons also die. So even in, in that lineage, it's supposed to be that his uh, family member inherit the mantle. But to him, he has no more sons anyway. And he knows there's no more, no more uh, gurus in that lineage to uphold the continued bloodline of the spiritual practice. So he says, study Grand Sahib uh, scripture. At least these are the teaching of the gurus, the true gurus, 10 of them. Continue, at least there are still blessings in there. But that is for his immediate disciples and descendants. Later on, 
probably is all diluted already, but still helpful. Like people believe in the Buddha, they know they should not kill, they should not steal, at least something to keep them afloat and not go to hell, not to descend into lower level and suffering. Okay? If they keep the precept as the Buddha taught, even now, if they don't kill, they don't steal, they don't lie, huh? I mean, normal people, uh, even if they eat a little meat, but without knowing the vegan stuff, without having hatred or, or killing instinct in their heart, keep the five precepts. They still can be reborn as human, you know, a decent human, have a comfortable life. And if they continue the five precepts like that, they will be reborn again as human, decent life, comfortable. So it helps to study the scriptures, and it helps to learn you know, from the Bible that you have to be good, you have to, you know, fear God and pray to Jesus, etc. It helps them, okay? That's why the ten guru of the Sikh tell them, study Grand Sahib. The Grand Sahib is your guru. What else can he say when he knows there's no more lineage left? But that doesn't mean he stopped there. It could be that one of his disciples or descendants of the disciple continue to study together a, a little while longer, and it could be that one of the master descend into that lineage afterward, after the ten guru passed away. And then he became a master, and then continue the lineage in elsewhere, not in his family lineage. You got that? Because it's like this. In the Sikh system, from the first guru to the tenth, it ends there. Why is that? Because one of uh, the family member of the master have a very selfish wish. One of the earlier Sikh master has a daughter, yeah? Okay. The Sikh master, they married, okay? But they don't indulge in, you know, physical sensation the way normal people do. They just... Uh, sometimes uh, have a corporal contact so that they can have children, okay? It's just tradition to have children. <laughs> so they have two or three children, maybe like that. Uh, once a year or twice a year to be together with wife, nothing more. Now, uh, one of the master has a daughter, okay? She was sitting with him. Even if he's a, she's a daughter of a master, she always had to sit lower than the master. Even a wife or the mother of the master always sit lower than, than the guru, all the time, in India like that. That you're not allowed to sit. It's just tradition. Out of respect, you don't sit the same high as the master, that's all. Okay, so this daughter, she sat on the ground. And the master of the Sikh at that time, earlier master, yeah? Not the tenth, but before that. And then she, he sat on his uh, bed to meditate, yes. And the daughter was sitting at his feet on the ground. And uh, somehow the bed was old and one of the legs fell off. Okay? So she worried the master would be awakened out of samadhi. She used her hand to hold it all night long. But the nails are pinned into her hand, bleeding, but she still holds it. Such a devotion, okay? So in the morning, the master awakes from samadhi, come back to the physical life body, and then realize what the daughter has done for him. He felt very, very touched, you know, not just as a master, but as a father as well. Such a filial daughter, of course, who wouldn't like huh? love? So he said, oh, okay, whatever you wish, I will grant it to you. Normally, master don't say that to anyone because they they just let the disciple develop according to their understanding and karma. The master don't favor any disciple and say, okay, I will grant you wish because I like you, <laughs> because you are my daughter, you are my wife, you are my son. No, 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 no. Or you are my favorite disciple, or you give me one million dollar nada. The master treat everyone equally. But because he was so touched, he came out of a pure, pure meditation samadhi all night long. So his mind is still so pure. He also forget the rule, yeah? And he was touched by his daughter devotion, sit all night with the nail in her, deep in her hand and bleeding, just to keep him in samadhi. 
because she knows the master meditates is very important for the disciples, for the world. So she sacrificed, sit like that instead of the leg of the bed. And then the master just saw that and so very touched. It's okay, whatever wish you have, I will grant it. Master really never says such thing, okay? But it's just a situation like that. And then the daughter said, I have only one wish. That the master lineage stay in the family. Oh, man. That is very selfish. You cannot do that. The master lineage should be passed on. The master mantle should be passed on to whoever worthy and enlightened and selflessly devoted to humankind, you know, for all beings. Not because a family member. But the master already promised. So he has to hold it, even though he was aghast as her request. Because he can foresee that this selfish wish will bring bloodshed into the Sikhism. At that time, there was no Sikhism or thirst. Not because the Master at that time or the first Guru Nanak never proclaimed any Sikhism, no nothing. He just go barefoot, go from one place to another, teaching people, whoever can have affinity with him or have wisdom to, to learn. Okay? He never uh, the, the want to make Sikhism or anything just so people about him. No, no, no. Just, just happen, okay, afterward. Because the king of that country at that time and his go and seek to destroy all the religion and all the preachers like Guru Nanak and his later successor. That's why we had trouble with, at that time. So they had to have some kind of defense uh, kind of system for the disciple and they call him to seek and would defend the weak, you know, the brothers and sisters. And uh, therefore, at that time, to recognize each other as Sikh in separation to others so that they can recognize each other when they see each other because they have to practice in secret, okay? Also, the disciples scatter everywhere, so they have to have some symbol to recognize. They have symbol, like they have a, a bracelet and you have your long hair have to wrap up in, in the cloth, yeah, and your hair have to have a comb, and inside you have a short, uh, what else I forgot, uh, five yeah, things. Five K. Five K? Yeah, five K. Everything starts with K, letter, so uh, it's called five K. Everything go with K, okay. A comb, a bracelet, and... A knife. Huh? A knife, or, or a dagger, a dagger. And the underwear short, you know, a short, like this, so that you... Female and male, same, so that you can identify, you know? And also be ready, ready to, to go... You ready know, to go to defend to others. Defend. Yeah, 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 that's what it is, okay? Otherwise, normally, the disciple don't ever need any yeah. knife or anything. But at that time, they're harassing them relentlessly. They want to destroy the master and the sick follower at that time. So they have to just defend themselves, you know, and run. Wow. And nowadays, they remain symbol, symbol, you can see him, okay? You see, so even uh, the, the master, master daughter and disciple are still that ignorant to wish like that, to wish that the master mantle always remain in the family. Family member not necessarily enlightened or worthy to be a master. <laughs> She is a good example for that, no? Otherwise, she would never ever think of even keep the mantle of mastership in her family. You see that? But the master already promised, so it goes like that. So from then on, their family member inherit the mantle of the Sikhism, as far as if they have son, okay? A daughter, no. I think not at that time, no. So, because of that, the Sikhism, from then on up to the tent, must always there's a bloody, bloody battlefield. Always a lot of war and killing and, you know, oppressing from the government, whatever government at that time. The master knew it, but, you know, a master promised you can't, you can't go backward can go back on that. Whew. Well, I don't have a daughter Pussy to, to hold my bed. I have a sofa, it's safer. 
<laughs> so far, it's always safe. Even if you fell down, you don't fall too far. Mm. Anyway, good, good. That's why I don't have any daughter, son, or whatever sit next to me. I, I avoid that in case. <laughs> but I also don't think uh, we should have any success. Up to now, not yet. But who knows in the future, maybe. If you have one, I will tell you, okay? On record video. <laughs> Long years ago, I thought maybe there's one. But then later, because the world changed, the karma changed so much, I don't think it's possible to anyone to handle the matter, you know, up to now. So I have to continue. Mm. Okay then, okay then. Any more? You want any more stuff? Yes. All right. I think i almost done with that and uh, this subject about the precepts. Uh, let's see if the Buddha say any more. Ananda, if any one of the monks' precepts, transmitting ma masters, or any one of the other monks practicing with him is not pure, then the Bodhimanda, as described, will not be successful. Even if you don't sleep for three months, <laughs> even if you're pure, if you find all the white cow and the dung and the grass and the uh, whatever you do, you know, more, the Buddha described more work to do, but I thought, oh, yeah, it's impossible, so forget that. I just read some for you, and you already think impossible. Okay. Therefore, the Buddha said, even then, if the bhikkhu, you know, the monk who transmitted the precepts to this ever sincere seeker, if he is not pure, then you do. <laughs> you just work for nothing. Ah, oh, it's that difficult. Not just that, okay, I just don't sleep three weeks and, and I find the cow and I do this, I do that. As the Buddha said, then I'm fine. Who knows if the, the BQ give you the precept is pure or not pure. He could do that maybe because he likes to do it, because he thinks he's pure, because he thinks he's worthy. You know, who knows? Maybe he thought it's not pure. Hmm? Therefore, even if you have all that from one of the monks, so the other precept to you, you can never be sure. This is the problem. All right, got that? Okay. So after three weeks, Buddha is still talking now. After three weeks, one sits upright still. And your job not done yet after three weeks, okay? Not sleeping, still not. After three weeks, one sits upright and still for a hundred days more. Oh, dear God. <laughs> Oh, ay, ay, ay. I thought after three weeks it's already kind of, oh, <laughs> you know, incredible marathon, feast. Three weeks non stop, no sleep, doing all this already. And still sit another hundred days. <laughs> My God, you should be always choose your birth whenever a living master is born. <laughs> so that when you grow up, your time, your age, your you come of age and you can go and grab this master and quick. Not doing all this. I don't think I can. I honestly tell you, not me, okay? Not three weeks non-sleep and doing all this uh, outer uh, performance and a hundred more days. How, how, how long is a hundred days? Three months? Three months plus. Okay. Those with sharp faculties will not arise from their seats and will become Srotapata Mabana. Yeah, mean one of the non, maybe non return. Okay? Right. Although their bodies and minds have not attained the ultimate fruition of sagehood, not yet, not the highest, but already as something on the way. Yeah. They know for certain, beyond exaggeration, that they will eventually accomplish Buddhahood. Yeah, they are already on the way after all that in 100 days. You have asked, the Buddha said to Anand, you have asked how the Bodhimanda is established. This is the way it is done. Ananda bowed at the Buddha's feet and said, after I left the home life, 
I rely on the Buddha's affectionate regard because I sought uh, erudition. I still have not been certified to the unconditioned, meaning Buddha has not said that he is already, you know, an ahat. Yeah, I told you. Mm. When I encountered that Brahma Heaven mantra, I was captured by the deviant spell. Though my mind was aware, I had no power to free myself. You understood? No. No, okay. Then I have to use my calendar talk again. <laughs> what is a Brahma Heaven mantra? Ananda went out begging for food. And these uh, prostitutes, because they have magical power in their family, okay? She has magical power also. She used a Brahma Heaven mantra, meaning that within the three worlds, this is the highest mantra, most powerful. No one can resist. She used that to seduce Ananda. And then he was like, uh, you know, blur and dazed. So he just followed her into the bedroom. And then she did what she wanted to do with him until he almost gone. But luckily, because he has been with the Buddha, very close to the Buddha, he was the Buddha's attendant day and night, every day. And he was pure, at least so whenever he was, yes. And of course, he has been with the Buddha uh, with many incarnations, not just this time. Always being his close attendant or his nearby acquaintance, his family, etc., etc., even in the animal's kingdom. So he remembered the Buddha last minute. He prayed, Buddha, please help me. I am falling. And then the Buddha came, or oh, he sent, is, uh, you know, came and recite other kind of mantra to counter this, to oppose this powerful mantra. Then, uh, of course, Ananda is free and he run, <laughs> he run back, forget his bowl, <laughs> food, whatever he wants to do, <laughs> run back. Mm. So that's why he said here that when I encounter that Brahma heaven mantra from the prostitute, yeah, I was captured by the deviant spell, though my mind was aware, but I had no power to free myself. That powerful. Even a Buddha disciple had to succumb to that power of that spell. Very powerful, because Brahma heaven is the highest heaven in the three worlds. So if they know that mantra, then I can use it and master it, then no one in the physical body will be able to resist and escape. Lucky for Anand, because he was always with the Buddha, life after life, and always doing good things with the Buddha or without the Buddha. He was always virtuous, moral, good, good, good physical humans, or divas, or animals. So because of that, he can even, in such a day's situation, mesmerize uh, spirit. He still can remember the Buddha and pray to his master for help. Otherwise, he's doomed, finished. So he's saying, uh, continue. Mm. I had to rely on Manjushri Bodhisattva to liberate me. That means the Buddha sent Manjushri immediately there and then free Ananda. Yeah. So he said, although I was blessed by the thirst come one spiritual mantra of the Buddha's summit and imperceptibly received its strength, I still have not heard it myself. The Buddha sent Manjushri to bring this Buddha Summit mantra, much higher than the Brahma Heaven mantra, to free Anand, yes. Although the Buddha told him that, yeah, that because of that mantra for Manjushri, so he's free. But he doesn't hear it yet himself. The Manjushri just went there and do it. But of course, inside, you know, just like you recite the five holy names inside, and somebody get benefit. Uh, but that person know it, because you told him, but he never heard it himself, okay? So, same. Ananda said he has not heard that mantra from the Buddha's summit, yes. 
So I only hope that the greatly compassionate one will proclaim it again to kindly rescue all the cultivators in this assembly and those of the future who undergo the turning wheel so that they may become liberated in body and mind by relying on the Buddha's secret sounds. Now, at that moment, everyone in the great assembly bow as one together, together at one, just bow down together, and stood up, waiting to hear the thirst come one's secret divisions and phrases. At that time, a hundred brilliant rays shrank from the mouth of the flesh of the crown of the world on one's head. A thousand petal precious lotus arouse from amidst those rays. Upon the precious flower sat at the thirst come one's transformation. From the crown of that Buddha's head, in turn, ten beams of light shone forth, each composed of a hundred rays of precious light. Every one of those glowing rays shone on lands as many as the sands of the ten Ganges rivers. Why, throughout empty space there were Vajra secret traces, spirits, each holding a loft, a mountain, and wielding a pestle. Just to show their power is don't mean much, okay. At that request, you know, of the Buddha, a secret mantra, all the Vajra, the Vajra God, those who uphold, uh, I mean, guarding the Dharma, and all those, they already standing ready, each one holding a mountain and a pestle. It's just their position, ready to protect the Dharma, to protect the Buddha's secret teaching, okay? So they're all ready. The great assembly, gazing upward, felt fearful admiration and sought the Buddha's kind protection. Because when the Buddha protectors are ready in their position, they can destroy anything. Anyone who is not pure, anyone who has a bad intention towards the Buddha or the Buddha's teaching, they are ready. That's why they hold the mountain and pestle, ready to crush anyone any being who is not respectful, who is not pure. Because this is a very sacred, secret mantra, and the Buddha uh, used that to rescue Ananda, and also maybe in the future being. That's why they are ready to protect it. Yeah? That's why the assembly, who are kind of uh, not yet strong in, in spiritual position and, and level, they are so scared fearful, and they ask the Buddha to protect them, because they, these are Vajra, Vajra uh, uh, gods, they are fearful looking, and holding big mountain and pestle ready to <laughs> attack anyone or crush anyone. So the, the assembly, not just monks and nuns or bodhisattva, but the assembly with the dragon and those ghosts and demons and all that good ones, and they're still fearful because they know they're not up to anything, up to any standard to protect themselves in case the Vajra gods want to crush them because they look too fearful, so big and giant, holding big mountain and pestle. And it's not a small one like the golf stick, yeah? They're big, you know, and mountain holding, ready. So they seek the Buddha's uh, protection and single-mindedly they listen as the thirst come one in the light at the, the invisible appearance on the crown of the Buddha's head, proclaim the spiritual mantra. That spiritual mantra is uh, more than ten pages long. <laughs> From 173 to 191. How much is that? More than ten pages, for sure. Yeah, I, I was right. You don't need it, okay? Number one, you have your protection. 
Okay, you have your master power protection. Number two, it is translated. <laughs> It is translated into Chinese phonetic, and I can't guarantee if it works. Uh, it might work if you're really sincere, of course, but it's uh, 20 pages long. If you keep reciting it, <laughs> maybe it works. Uh, you want me to recite it? No, no. no need, huh? Okay. Whew, it takes a long time to recite. Maybe another time, if I have to, okay? If it's good for you, mm. maybe another time. I will ask the Buddha whether or not <laughs> I have enough power to recite it for you, okay? Not just the words, but you have to have this kind of uh, inside power mm, to recite it, even if it's translated into just phoneticized Chinese. Got that? Okay. All right. Uh, the Buddha prays this secret mantra, okay? Mm. Very, very much. But I think we end it here now. Mm. So tomorrow we continue. But uh, maybe with the mantra, maybe not. Maybe with a mantra, maybe with another one, because I have promised you something else. <laughs> I didn't promise a mantra. <laughs> Imagine, I don't know how long it take the Manjushri to recite this mantra while Ananda was in the helpless situation. <laughs> but Manjushri pronounced the mantra probably you know, quietly, but it affects immediately and wake Ananda out of this uh, bewitched slumber. <laughs> and Ananda ran back to the Buddha with uh, Mantachi daughter trailing behind. <laughs> wow, what a scene! Huh? <laughs> what a scenery! It's like movies, yeah. Come back here, come back here. <laughs> and complain to the Buddha, give Ananda back to me, he's mine. <laughs> okay, it's 12 o'clock already. Well, your mind can only take so much at a time. So even though you're interested, you should digest this. And then we continue next day, huh? Tonight I will be sleeping in a tent like you. <laughs> I will enjoy it. Fresh air and all. Thank you for being so polite and generous with your clapping. <laughs> your clapping. Okay. Next time, any unnecessary question or not urgent question, please wait until I finish, okay? It's better for all of you, okay? You are not alone in the assembly. You are in the midst of 10,000 plus people. Please consider others before you. That is the minimal uh, courtesy and minimal selflessness, okay? Yeah? And if you listen to the teaching of the sage, even from by time gone, it's good for you, okay? Instead of just thinking of one single question, which it wasn't that important, it wasn't really necessary to ask in the middle of that. You should respect the Buddha teaching and continue listening. That's the best, okay? If any question, there is time to ask, okay? Anything to do with the subject is better. To keep it, the energy, you know, clean, pure, concentrated, and blessing flowing. Huh? Next time, remember that, all of you, okay? A good night. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Happy New Year. Silence.
Доброжелателни зрители, оценяваме присъствието ви за днешния епизод, озаглавен с оранга Масутра, четирите ясни и непроменими инструкции за чистота, заключение и установяване на място за пробуждане, част 8 от 8 в Между учителя и учениците. Следва не е късно да получиш просветление. Въпроси и отговори. Част пета от пета. Слова на мъдростта. Веднага след важните новини. Моля, останете с Supreme Master Television за още позитивни предавания. Нека щедрите ви сърца, добри думи и състрадание бъдат служба на човечеството. Benevolent viewers, we appreciate your company for today's episode entitled The Suranga Masutra, the four clear and unalterable instructions on purity, conclusion, and establishing a place for awakening, part 8 of 8, on between master and disciples. Coming up next, it's not too late to get enlightenment. Questions and answers, part 5 of 5, on words of wisdom, right after noteworthy news. Please stay tuned to Supreme Master Television for more positive programming. May your generous hearts, kind speech and compassion be of service to humanity. Our programs offer many languages. Please visit suprememastertv.com forward slash schedule and suprememastertv.com forward slash DMD.